Welcome to the Busy Being Born podcast with your hosts Kamande and Kigondu. Yeah, uh, man. Yeah, how are you, bro? I am all right. I am all right. Why didn't you buy your orange t-shirt? Eh, uh, cause I'm a boy. I have a choice of picking whatever <laughs> I did. <laughs> Why didn't you, <laughs> bro? But all good. Blue all good. looks dope on yellow. It does. It does. And you're looking great. Very good to see you. Maze, yeah. you're looking good as well. So okay. You say you it. You you never explicit with your compliments of how I look. Uh, b- what do you mean, bro? I tell you all the time how good looking you are. And I say thank you. <laughs> and I look away and go awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you as well. Now check them guns are out. The guns are out, man. Yeah, the working out, out. Yeah, yeah. Hey, son, I'm. My back is great. My knee yeah. issues are almost done. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, Maze, if you if you're wondering what you're talking about, Rudy Skiza episode 19, episode 15. This guy struggled through a season, yeah. but all is well. With all him. is well. We are grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Busy Being Born podcast. If you're listening to us on whatever app, uh, uh, in fact, preferably, if you're listening to us on our website, where when do you the one we are celebrating? The that most. is true. But also find us on Spotify, find yes. us on Apple Podcasts, and wherever it is that you consume or listen to your podcast you preferred application for sure for yeah. sure so ladies Twende. and gentlemen Twende Kazi, welcome this, welcome this episode is brought to you by funky science funky science is an education technology company striving to ensure that kindness that learning is incorporated into cognitive learning at a young age through creative experimentation funky science delivers creative science experiments via online classes um, camps clubs and events with the aim of encouraging students to love and practice science the direct beneficiaries of funky science are school going children of ages between 5 and 13 so if you have a 5 to 13 year old and you think they'd love science then funky science is a place for you um the experiments are interactive and encourage children to ask all sorts of questions about science and also to participate in a wide variety of experiments through these experiments um they teach children the value of science in their day to day lives and that science is not only manageable but very easy and fun. So that's the fun in funky science. Uh, the experiments are tailored towards providing children with the necessary information and interest that they will require to pursue science-based careers later in their lives. The experiments are simple and use common material that can um, that is available uh, at the household, in household, and everyone can identify with. And... Um, uh, in addition to the funky science kits, they are uh, they have a funky science science fest this 2022. Um, oh, yeah? yeah, so that's running between 5th and 16th of December um, at uh, Fair Mile School on Oyakiwe. So if you have a kid between the ages of 5 and 13, please visit um, funkyscience.co.ke or write to ask at funkyscience.co.ke. Um, you can also call the founder, a good friend of the podcast at 0728-440834. And really just visit funkyscience.co.ke slash events. Funky Science, um, yeah, nurturing the next generation of scientists to solve all these problems, especially, especially climate change. Especially yeah. climate change, yeah. bro. Why why didn't you like not read? We saw my number yake. Number yake. No, no, that's yeah. that's actually the, that's the office <laughs> line. <laughs> that, that's I'm just saying, it felt like you you know the number of it. I I know it. That's not the number. Oh, that's that's the, the office number. line. Okay, I I don't so. know all of them. That's what's up. Yeah, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Karibuni sana. You know how to tease a brother out. Uh, let's <laughs> let's do this. We have a guest. We have a guest. We have a guest. We have a guest. <laughs> Should I go in? Go, go for it. Ask me the questions. Let's um, go. Are they brilliant? Are they brilliant? Yeah. Bro, they are more than brilliant. Uh. A phenomenal. Are they representing the motherland? Ay, yeah. They, where do we start? But you'll hear in the stories. Okay. And representing the motherland on another level. And last but not least, are they busy being born? <sighs> Definitely busy being born. Ladies and gentlemen. Tell us more. Watch anyway, there's a story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today's guest is a true definition of a Kalisi. 
I do a Game of Thrones, Khaleesi, this Number one. Four. <laughs> yes. Four, Khaleesi. You did, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> a queen, an artist, a mother, a Kenyan radio and TV legend that very recently made her long awaited theater and TV comeback on Speak Their Names and Country Queen, respectively. Before that, you probably had listened to her on late night radio, or I definitely did. This is back in the day, <laughs> Capital FM. You watched her on Wengula Moto and many other TV. TV shows. Your parents probably watched her on stage at the Phoenix. This is like Kitambo when Lupita was in her teens, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, so ladies and gentlemen, hey, what a legend. I could go on and on. Like this is that chick we all had a crush on from the Amini Pa Juju. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you remember that video? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are ready for this one. Question <laughs> is, are you? So many have wondered where she's been for a while. Many have wondered the secret to her youth. Many have wondered all that and so much more. And perhaps you'll get to answer that and so much more, of course. But you know what we wonder right here, the busy being born. What has she collected on her way to the top and beyond? What gems has she gathered and can share with us around the arts, around life, around love, around success, failure, fame, etc., etc. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we give you the one and the only Phenomenal, I don't want to say actress, I just want to say a phenomenal actor, phenomenal lady actor, a casting agent, an acting coach, and so many other things you'll discover today. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the one and the only Nini Washera. Karibu sana. Thank you. Hey, those are ah, accolades you gave. But thank you very much for having me. Like we, we even should have said award winning. Award winning. But hey, it is well. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Pole, getting you out this early out here. No, I'm an early bird. I was up by four o'clock. I <laughs> sat outside and had some coffee. I like being outside just before the sun rises or when the sun is rising and when there's nobody else outside. Yeah. So coming here early was a good thing. That's what's up. But I'm... it's nice to see you, Scribani. Hey, hey, <laughs> <laughs> yes. My torturer. There you go. So <laughs> let's uh, let's put some context there. So I had the honor of torturing the one and the only Nini Washera. Yeah, you grabbed my boobs a couple Akiyanani. of times. I swear, this but guy. But please say with We're consent. We're off to a good start. <laughs> please say with consent, <laughs> like I'm a professional I actor. I felt tortured for real. <laughs> yes, with consent. She would always just surprise me. I hope you don't mind if I grab your boob. Nini, I hope you don't mind if I grab your crotch. <laughs> I don't like, remember. Hey, do you? You do you. You no, do no, your I fabulous <laughs> self. <laughs> it lights out. Um, Maze. Being born. Um, <laughs> right, like, like right on cue. <laughs> but anyway, Maze, it was such an honor to be with you on stage. It was. And it is a big honor to have you on the Busy Being Born podcast. Thank you for having me. But it was, you know, I hadn't ever met you. I hadn't crazily, I had never heard of you. Yeah. And then you were cast on this play, and I was like, I, who, I know Brian Ogola. Who's this Martin Kigondu guy? I look for you on Instagram. You're not very um, big on being social, but you're busy being born, I hey. assume. So <laughs> that's where your busyness goes. And then I act with you, and you are so Asante. amazing on Asante. stage. I mean, screen, I think you'd be the, as amazing, but you blew my mind. Asante. Every rehearsal was like, <gasps> Oh wow. oh wow! Oh wow! Oh man! Oh, Every wow. single rehearsal, he's mind blowing. Ah, Sante, I Sante. I love to hear that. <laughs> ah, Sante, Sante. You know, I but love this guy to death, and so whenever I hear anything about him, or really most of my friends, all of my friends, it makes me so happy. That's what's up. Let's 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 not focus yeah. on me though. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, yeah, I can switch this around. You know, I've yeah. been on radio longer Lico, than I you. I know what she's doing. I know yeah. what she's doing. So, <laughs> how did you get into? It's very um, intentional. Uh, the podcast. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Anyway, <laughs> you know, Monday, it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a pleasure to meet you too. I was telling Abu just before we started recording that um, I'm really this nervous. What? I was nervous since last night. Nervous. Yeah. Hundred percent. Like uh, I always have this thing before on on the, on the eve of a session, uh, and last night was just on another level, and so I had to like breathe. <laughs> Nini, <laughs> Nini. <sighs> Why? What did you think? And, I and here we are. No, it's because like Mato said, we've listened. I have listened. Actually, all of us have listened to you on radio and been a big fan of your work for so many years. So, literally, that's how it feels like this is how it feels like to be with a star 
<laughs> so I would say excited, nervous excitement. Nervous excitement, yes. Okay, not nervous um, like no, no, I'm not in a bad way. No, no, no. You intimidate me because that wasn't the point. No, that was never the no, point. No, 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 not intimidation. But it's also important to have that feeling. I think I value it. Whenever I don't have it, means that maybe to some extent, if there's not that physiological thing happening, maybe I'm not, um, I'm not super excited to be doing this. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. If something is you, you really passionate and excited about doing something even in your subconscious, then maybe that's a natural feeling and it's okay. So yeah. you just sit with it and know that this means a lot to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. whenever I don't have that I I sort of go back and, you know, question the motives of doing whatever it is that I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So it's maybe a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, exactly. I learned that from uh, one of my former bosses. It's a natural feeling. You just need to learn how to sit with it. Uh do you always do this every morning? Do you get up at four and enjoy the sunrise? Um, not at four. Just today was at four, and maybe because I was excited about coming here. But let's say by five o'clock, I'm out of bed by five. So I will watch the sunrise. And it's been cold, so the sun hasn't really like given me anything dramatic. But normally, I will be watching some beautiful sunrises. Amazing. And how long have you been doing it? Wow. Wow. I think, uh, Wow. Maybe ten years, eight years, ten years. Yeah. Nice. And and did you notice a change in whatever it is, maybe how your general outlook of the day looks like or just the entire I don't know. How yeah, once you started doing it. Because I mean, at that time in the morning I, I would read, I would always read something that was spiritually uplifting or teaching, but something that would like um feed my spirituality and then I'd meditate. And then I'd have my coffee and my cigarette, and then the day can begin. And for me, I noticed that because I would then go on to set after that, and after you get on set, then you have makeup on you, you have um, wardrobe on you, you have people all over you, then it gave me a sense of calm and a sense of being by myself. And of course, it kept me grounded. But I've always been the kind of person who is pr like prone to like emotional turmoil so i'll be i'm almost manic i'm manic one day and then i'm depressed the next day like a bipolar sort of thing but i don't think i have bipolar disorder i just have a very bipolar personality and this kept me grounded this keeps me grounded especially when i'm busy yeah yeah um you this is very exciting the moment especially the moment you say the meditation yeah you've been meditating for all this time so what's your technique what's your approach so I is it guided? It's some most sometimes it's guided because sometimes I'm trying to deal with certain things like get over something or forgive myself for something or um, change something. Like sometimes it's amazing how prayer and meditation can like help you through difficult situations. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that I read, I will meditate upon that thing that I read. And I was reading a course in miracles for almost four or five years. It's a beautiful. Uh, book that was written apparently by this woman called I think Helen Schuller and she she wrote um, what she was told to write by the spirit of Jesus Christ but this book has 365 days of teachings so it has a manual for students mm. and then it has the text so every day I would read a chapter of the text and then I would read the teaching the, the actual lesson for the day and it takes you into like um, your perception of the world, your perception of of your, your you as an individual in this world and what your purpose is here. It takes you into forgiveness. It teaches you that the language of life is love, that the purpose of being here is love. And the only way you can get there is through forgiveness. And mm -hmm. the only way that you can get through forgiveness is to start to look at yourself. You know, you don't look outside and say that person did this and that person did this. and when you've been victimized as a young person, you tend to blame a lot, right? So I had to deal with all my nonsense from when I was a child. And this meditation, this book took me through um, 365 days of healing, but I read it three or four times until it became part of my dialogue. And so then my mind changed or my perception changed because you have to practice it in order for it to become a reality for you. And then I will breathe 
I will just use a breathing technique. Yeah, breath work. Yeah. And it's not it's I'm the I'm normally the one who will count the breaths and count the breath until I feel like um like my I'm released from within. I don't know how to explain it. It's really hard to explain what happens when you meditate because it's a very personal thing. But then if you're feeling any sort of angst or any sort of turmoil or any sort of confusion, you feel that release through that breath work. You know how we can explain it? Yeah. We can we can attach uh, brain scans um, to our podcast notes. Maybe that's the best way to explain <laughs> the effect of meditation. No, se- seriously. Really? Yeah, really. Maybe that's the best way to explain it. Yeah. It's very hard to explain the effect of meditation but then on even the brain and the effect of maybe, let's say, mind-altering drugs. Yes. Yeah, it's very, very hard. It's very hard to explain yeah. the personal experience of... You see, that's the thing. The brainwave will give you a pattern, but it won't tell you the it personal you the, experience. That is true. Yeah. There's a poverty of words, really. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You have to be in the experience of it. But then, you know, I also did Vipassana, and Vipassana oh. is amazing. Uh, 10 days of silent meditation where you, like, really get you to do, hear yeah, yourself. The Dharma.org one in Kenya. Yes. Yeah. And it's... Uh, it's uh, the perfect space if you need to just like, de- de- you know, decompress, and it's free. It's free, mm-hmm. and they feed you. So y- even if you're broke, you can just sign up <laughs> and go. You, guy, you know, you're good for ten days you, at least. I, I don't know if you'd be good because the meditation <laughs> is so difficult. It's difficult. The, you know the dropout trait. I was just oh, discussing yeah. this with a friend. Sorry. First of all. Um, the things you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Super if, passionate if about. If they, they did a brain scan on me right now, they're just going, <laughs> you know, with every sentence. It's amazing. Um, so the dropout rate um, at, I think, two or three days yes, is really, really high. Yeah. Yeah, for the 10 day. Exactly. Like, and this is global, not just in Kenya. And you see it, you know, when you're sitting there in the room where everyone has the meals, especially because you normally tend to sit where, I mean, no, they actually put your name. So you sit where you've sat from the beginning of the meditation. Then you see, Aya, Miri is gone. Aya, Jennifer is gone. Aya. You just start seeing people, MIA, 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 MIA. And I'm not a quitter. As in things can be so bad, but I'm not a quitter. I always tell myself, if I committed to this thing, then I have to see it through the end. Because I'll never forgive myself if I quit. I'll just be like, Tish, you wimp. Hmm. Tish. You just ran away from that thing. How dare you call yourself a strong black woman? Mm. So I'm really nasty with myself. So I don't quit. It was the most difficult 10 days of my life. But at about day eight, you just get into this like um, Zen space where you're with yourself and you're totally okay with the noise. You've learned how to dis- either dissociate from the noise or like not be affected internally by the talking that goes on. I don't know if everyone has this voice in their head. Everyone has a narrator voice. Everyone. Everyone has it. Yeah. I mean, the the idea of meditation is to really step back and listen to it and see it. Come yes. Because it's there. It's always going to be there. And it's really a thought. I think it's nothing else. It's, yeah, it's, it's or just like a thought. It's the language that you've been taught to speak it's to language, yourself yes. in. Yeah. Because sometimes when I hear the things I say to myself, I'm like, who the hell would talk to <laughs> To even I wouldn't talk to my friend like this, like I wouldn't have a friend if they spoke to me like this. And here I am, look at you, shameless being. I'm like, Hiya, hiya. yeah, you said that. Mm. So that voice, you start to be okay. And when you start to be okay with it, she sort of sort of dissipates. When you start to be like, I I don't want you there. I don't want. And that's what Vipassana teaches you, just to be unaffected. Become the, not not really. So you first start by becoming the one who knows which is, we'd say, that's consciousness. Yeah. And then even when you get there, then also let go of associating yourself with the consciousness itself. Exactly. Yeah? So you, you start, I, again, I'm sorry for nodding out on this, but it's so amazing <laughs> that you've done this. And I want, like, there's so many questions I want to ask about your experience and how, um, what has changed in your life and how you see it from just a matter of, you know, dealing with the day-to-day. And maybe you mentioned about, reading something spiritual Mm -hmm. because i in 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 my um understanding and maybe let's say for for now i'll call it a goal the goal of all these practices is not just to be calm in the moment it's actually spiritual enlightenment Mm -hmm. and to know that it's possible maybe that should be the goal and then at some point you also let let go of that goal Uh, so i have questions on that but um coming back to the idea of vipassana and 
amazing uh, the amazing description you've given it so the idea is you recognize everything as either the five aggregates we might call them that so there are thoughts there's form there's perception um there is uh, volitional creations in the mind which would be maybe um yeah let's call them volitional um appearances of thought in the mind then lastly there is consciousness mm-hmm. so you let go of everything recognizing that that is neither mine nor i right and yeah. in the end you also let go of consciousness so what are we talking about which is like you know being aware of everything that's happening and first of all being the one who knows and then yeah. eventually and i could be butchering this like if a teacher had me like <laughs> let's let's say goenkaji or whoever had me talking to them say ah you're butchering the teachings but i think that's that's the whole the the, the, whole, the whole path i let you go to ask a few questions no, bef- before i go on ah no you could you because could. I you could know go, i don't I mind i could you know go I don't on um when did you do the the 10 day retreat um i think it was 26 2016 or 2017 yeah. i'm so bad at remembering the years when i did shit by the way but i think around there yeah and and what was the biggest change if any uh, that you witnessed once you got out so what was are there things that are still integrated into your day to day i mean i feel like there's like triggers that I became very aware of I became very aware of what it is that triggers me into cycles of depression right and I became very aware of the stories that I tell myself that then become my truth and so what changed is like this ability to like look at yourself and look at your thoughts and dissociate yourself the i from that that part of That's your thoughts. story exactly it's yeah. just a freaking story yeah. it's and it's not the truth and to constantly be asking is that the truth is that the truth yeah so this happened because of xyz like and always when you feel victimized like i was sexually molested at a very young age and i thought it was because i had taken myself to him you know he told me come i went to him and i kept going back to him and he kept molesting me but i was like 7 years old and i was blaming myself for that and the vipassana taught me to like really look at that story that narrative like okay you've raised a 7 year old child do you think she would know what she's taking herself to so why is it that you're being hard on yourself so that's not a truth that's not a truth but then the voice in your head has made it such a truth that you believed all all the things it says you've believed it but without vipassana i don't think i would have noticed that this voice existed because at some point i was like who's talking to me like like that because you hear it There's, you know you don't speak to anyone in, in in vipassana you don't have a conversation with a single person you don't journal you don't have your phone you sit amongst people you can't even walk fast at it to release energy it you have to be in a very calm state of mind and people are mumbling to themselves people are laughing other people are crying other people are sitting and like just staring into the nothingness um peep some people look like they're in like with buddha on the clouds you know <laughs> and there's a way that you have to <laughs> like sit with yourself and then recognize i thought i was crazy i was like i'm hearing these people talking to me in my brain but then when i was living in nairobi just doing my life i didn't know that that voice was there so vipassana made me very aware of my crazy voices and that's the most important thing of the, the the mindfulness of everything that's happening Ex- around and i you. think from that awareness comes everything else like mm-hmm. if you just keep that awareness you might not like um i don't know sometimes i wonder it's like a friend of mine said that this um idea of previous lives or other dimensions has replaced the thought of the afterlife or be- the, the belief in the afterlife it's become the new So you know we used to believe that when you die you go to heaven if you're good and if you're bad you go to hell. Now this idea of living in alternate dimensions and having lived in different dimensions and living them concurrently and I will die and I will go into another dimension has replaced the belief in the afterlife. Afterlife. So is are any of them real? You know, like spiritual upliftment or um the place where you, you you get to where you become one with god is that real or has that just replaced the belief in the guy on the throne and being mm. punished for good and bad i feel like humanity grapples for these 
answers. I, answers and hangs on to an idea and then that becomes the truth for a time and then it something happens like now we've lost our faith in Jesus Christ because he didn't come <laughs> <laughs> you know he didn't come us guys were waiting hey, work at 2000 baba hey you may think I'll just come he had that in it we had his schedule we had his calendar we had his calendar and then he didn't come he didn't so su- suddenly <laughs> that belief in Jesus Christ coming for his people has faded and this new new age belief has taken over as a new thought system yeah. but are either of them the truth it depends on who you ask yeah yeah, yeah it depends on who you ask my thoughts um, I, i i don't like go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on for a few hours yeah you go for a few hours but all good uh, all good <laughs> in both the meditation and the the reading um there are hints about your childhood so i think this would also be a good like segue into that part of your life let's talk about it where where did you where did you grow up uh, all that basics to kwenda shule it was your childhood like let's talk about that well that's a lot i grew up yeah in um okay when ugh, ngumo then kuna then ngumo that's where i spent my childhood the same house in ngumo and one place in kuna that i absolutely love because it was this huge compound that had like a forest and a river at the bottom of the land and i think we that's where we created most of our adventures as children you know we would be climbing mount everest we would be fighting wars we would be like um our games were just mind blowing and i think that's why the acting ah. was ignited in me But my folks had bought a house in Gumo Estate, house number 188. Hey. I miss that Kakona <laughs> house by the way. Hey. I'm the second born in a family of four girls. Um and our names are Raha, Nini, Tatu, Tabu. And my mom named us those names because she said if I find a mzungu called Washera Gatere then I will name you Samantha. Oh. So we don't have English Wait, names. Wait, is it because you wanted Samantha? I wanted to be Samantha <laughs> Fox Washera. <laughs> because there was an actress called Samantha Fox, Ooh. right? So and I knew I wanted to be an actress and I was like, how can you call me Nini? What kind of name is Nini? They'll just be teasing me, mom. What? What? And she's like, yeah, you can cry all you want, but your name is Nini. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, before you go on. Has that sentiment Uh, sentiment oh, changed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Completely. Okay. Yeah. Completely. I love my name. And you look back and you're like thanks mom. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and I love all my sister's names, yeah. you know, they're so unique and we all have our different identities and I think the and very u- unique different identities and I think it also comes out of our names. Mm, yeah. Something as simple as uh, eh go on. Umeanza too. You started and Gomo was like eh hey, we new babini like No? No, why is that Ubabi? Why is that but like, uh, uh, back in the day. Back okay, in so the day but it was all right. I know. Us guys were like middle upper class, yeah. baby. That's really cool. But it's because my dad is an engineer. Uh-huh. So he worked for a company that was very like um he worked in a managerial position of a company that was based around the world called APV. So they really took mm-hmm. care of their people. So the house in Kuna, I think had been was a company house. the cars were company cars so it was like he was in like a nice nest yeah. and uh, as a second born and my parents were upper m- middle upper class it didn't last in that space because when he left APV and started his own company yeah. we fell from grace you guys <laughs> we landed in uh, in like debt and in not abject poverty but quite a bit of difficulty to the point where he had to leave and go to the states but growing up we had a really good childhood he is My mom was very strict so we were only allowed to play with my cousins and my dad has like five brothers and he's the last one of the five brothers so we had lots of cousins Catch to play them. with um bullies the boys were such crazy bullies the girls were such great adventurers and performers and we're still close to this day um to some level we all formed like little cliques and my family spent a lot of time hanging out amongst the extended family and we'd go to shags on holiday to stay with shosho in gaine and we were not allowed to milk the cows but we could go watch not allowed to pick, pick the coffee but we could go watch not allowed to pick up a jembe but we could go watch Why it is was this? ridiculous what because, Nairobi? because we were mutahi's children ah. they were her son's children mm. and shosho adored the her last sons. born yeah okay both, all, all of sons. them okay 
all her sons mm. were like kings. Mm. The daughters, I wouldn't say the same <laughs> thing, but the sons were treated like kings. And so because we were growing up in Nairobi and back then, the culture was almost like, if you leave the village and your kids go and you go to Nairobi and then your kids are now now in, incorporated into the English system, now you figured, yeah. right? We had completely let go of who we were as Africans and we thought that being the more white we were, the better English we spoke, the more winging my voice was, and then I'm, I'm, more, I'm, I'm a civilized or I'm a wealthy or I'm a upper class being because of how I speak. Things, yeah. So in Shags, we're not allowed to be like Shags people. We're, not, we're just not allowed to light fires, none yeah. of that stuff. So it's crazy because I've grown up to like learn how to teach myself to dig because I love planting trees and I didn't know how to dig. I didn't know how to use that bleeding djembe and I had to watch, you know how you watch a, a, a guy, work, a laborer working in the garden digging and you're like, what muscle in his back is he using? Is he, he's not throwing the djembe with his arms. He's not using, because you know, a Nairobi person really like <laughs> throws yeah. out that djembe <laughs> and then you tire your arms out. And yeah. it's, it's not an arm movement, but I had to teach myself because nobody ever let us, even a wheelbarrow. You should have seen me when I bought my first wheelbarrow, you guy, the excitos mm -hmm. of not being told, leave it alone! Because I'd never <laughs> been allowed to use a wheelbarrow. Yeah. But it wasn't bad then. It's only now in hindsight that I think, why weren't we allowed to? Then we just played. We just ran wild in nature. Yeah. We lived in wild open spaces. So I grew up with grass and trees and my mom is a, has a green thumb and she, she was a, a homemaker, so she was always home. But there's, even if your parent is home, there's also trouble that still comes into your life. So unfortunately, my older sister and I got molested by the same guy who was our shamba boy when we were seven and eight respectively. And we never told my mother. And then we left Kuna and moved back to Nguma when my dad had left APV and he had started his own company. Nguma was the house we, they had bought. And Nguma was a much smaller space. So now we, and my mom was very strict, so we're not allowed to play outside the gate with any of our friends. So you, you'd be seeing kids like playing shake Mom, please, let's can we go play? No. Yeah. You see kids playing Kati, Mom, please, can we go? No. And if you tell her you're bored, then she says only stupid people get bored. And it's not my job to entertain you. It was my job to give birth to you. So my mom was that kind of woman. She just didn't play. So um, after Standard 8, I went to boarding school um, in Moranga. But for primary school, I'd been in Consolata prima Primary oh. School. Mm -hmm. And then when I left in Standard 8 and went to Moranga, I just feel like all those four years of my high school were spent in Moranga because we didn't have midterm. We only came back on the holidays. Yeah. And when I was in high school, my parents moved to Ridgeways. And that's where we sp I spent my teen years. Still locked in the compound, not being allowed to play with other kids outside of the outside of the compound, but Ridges was scary because it was like a coffee plantation across from us, and then like Karura Forest, and which hadn't been fenced. This was like just after Wagari Madai had secured the forests yeah. of Kenya. So we spent a lot of time, just the four of us girls, no brother, playing together. Mm. Which high school did you go to in Moranga? Kahuhia girls. Kahuhia. Yeah, yeah, that's where I got into drama, actually. Yeah, mm. that was actually something I was about to jump in. Yeah. Um, Samantha. Samantha Fox. Yeah. yeah. So did you discover her before high school? Is that when you started thinking, oh, this could be a thing that is done. I could do this. No. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, when we were young, we were such performers, but I don't know how I've not told you. That. Ah, so it's from the games and it, the performing. And the perf so now my, my, I don't know, uh, that generation of parents, I don't know if everyone used to do it, but m I know my parents used to do it. She'd be like, we're having guests practice a song. So now we have <laughs> to practice a <laughs> the song then we have to perform the song. Then you get rebellious, and my mom does not allow rebellion in her house. So your rebellion has to be creative, yeah? We're not going to do a Christian song. We're going to do a skit. We're not going to do a skit. We're going to do a Michael Jackson um, dance routine. Yeah. So in our rebellion of the go and sing for the guests, we started creating our own like um, performances, and we formed a dance group called... The Thunderbird Girls after Grease <laughs> Lightning. You know, we couldn't too be the dope. pink ladies because yeah. we were too dope. We were too cool for school. So we were the Thunderbird, the Thunderbird Club. 
Club. And okay. if you know Wamboi Thimba, who's a stylist, and Washuka Thimba, who's a makeup artist, we were we grew up together, so those were also ah, and then f- f- part of the club. Part of the club. Hey. And then Eric, their brother Thimba, was our Kadayamoko, mm. the production runner. <laughs> 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 and my baby sister Tarure. So we did dances for everyone's birthday, and so we were like we're. Four girls and my family and Washuka and Wamboi and Eric. So th- in a year, those are eight performances. And then mm-hmm. we have four parents. So those mm-hmm. are 12 performances in a year. And then there's Christmas and this. So we all just performed. And then in church, we would be told to sing, you know, get up there and sing. So we would practice like a cappella. My sister is a fantastic singer, my older sister. And I'm tone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> it was so crazy because I didn't realize that until much later. She'd be so irritated as they're trying to teach me, this is your voice. And then if I hear you singing, I go to I'll your get, voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time performing in church and also for parties. And I think by the time I was, when my mom named me Nini when I was um, eight years old. And I knew then that I wanted to be called Samantha Fox and I knew then that I wanted to be an actor. But I had done a a McLean's commercial when I was six years old with my sparkling, beautiful white teeth. Yeah, for for, for, for those of us, (laughs) what's McLean's? Oh, it was the Colgate of back then. McLean's toothpaste. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Then she said the teeth, Nico. Yeah, Yeah. I wasn't wrong. So I was swinging... And then in like a white dress, and then I had a ding in my teeth. And I thought, oh my God, I looked like the most beautiful <laughs> princess on the earth. Uh, so from that moment on, I wanted to be on TV. I wanted uh, to perform, but I wanted to be a dancer. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted okay. to be a, an actor, but more than that, I wanted to be a dancer. And my dad would not allow me to be a dancer. So I got into acting as the default mm. yeah because i really wanted to study um performing arts in australia i remember i found edith cohen university back then when there was no internet i got the brochure i begged him to give me the fee to apply but he couldn't afford it we were, our family was in, fi- in financial turmoil by then so i ended up going to usiu to do business administration <laughs> boring that's just across <sighs> Any across the road, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 So when are we talking USIU in your early twenties now? No, in by the time I was eighteen, I was in USIU. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So th- there's a lot of open tabs there, and before we go right. on yeah. this journey of how you, you know, you take that realization that you actually want to do this into high school and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned that you went to consolata school, and but you also mentioned you being rebellious. So like if your mom says, perform, you're not going to perform a Christian song, you're going to perform a pop song, whatever, right? Yeah. What was, your, what was your relationship with, uh, did you grow up in church? Or at this time, was your mother very adamant on it? No, I grew up in a golf course. Okay. No. <laughs> 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 oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh-huh. My parents are my <laughs> my parents are nuts. Like we would be locked in the car because golf courses back then you're not allowed to bring children. Oh. So we grew up in the golf on in the golf club parking with drawing books and coloring books. My mom would hit me. I did that only once, Washera. She did that a few times. Oh, so we would travel yeah. to different places. My dad would love to play golf <laughs> and. Uh, my mom then became a golfer by default because the husband is a golfer and. In the 80s and 70s, you did as your husband said. So if your husband said, you must play golf with me, then, and I don't know if it happens now, but then she became a golfer. And so a lot of the time we spent in the golf club parking lot, in the car while they played golf. Terrible experience. Terrible, terrible experience. But when I was about uh, maybe nine, eight or nine years old, I we took a walk and I found a church in Cuna. And I remember being so excited because I remember going to school and people talking about church. And I'm like, you guys go to church on Sunday. Why do you guys go to church on Sunday? So we found this church and then we come back home and we beg my mom, please, 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 please take us to church, mom. Please, please, please take us to church. Biggest mistake of my life. My mom is now a bishop. (laughs) (laughs) That was a plot twist. (laughs) Plot twist. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. Story. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Mm. 
Oh wow. Um <laughs> should we go more in I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm a bit yeah, that yeah? hit me hard. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz I mean nataka kutake a totally different Take turn. the tangent. Okay. Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. So right before we go really further into your story, so we've looked at your current place here yeah? and the what you do in the morning and all. Sindio. Then we talked about uh the season when you saw it best to venture internally. Yeah, through meditation and all. And uh, there's a bit of looking at the trauma there, placing it back to back in the day. At what point do you realize, oh, I need to address this? Or is it disturbing you? Like, is it in high school when you're like, what happened to me a few years back wasn't right? Is it immediately? Am I much, much later in your life when you're like, wait, whatever happened back in the day needs to be addressed? It's when I had my daughter. Uh. And it's this is one of the things I realized that your every year your child goes through is you go through that year that you experienced at that age. So mm. when she's 2, you go through your 2 year old, when she's 3, you go through your 3 year old. Mm. So if you this trauma when she gets to that age, something gets stuck in you emotionally. At least it happened with me. Oh. So then I became um irrationally like like my depression was insane because i was at the height of like my success in radio and tv but it was like <laughs> inversely to, proportional to my mental state and my daughter is now 6 years old 7 years old that and i start getting these moments of rage in in fact even towards my mother like i don't want her to touch me and i'm like what's going on so then i seek therapy and then during the therapy we get to this place where there's something that happened in this period of time and my sister has like a memory of an elephant but she doesn't volunteer the information unless you now go and what is she what happened so you, i can call her now and i say what happened at this time at this place and she's like this and this and this and this and this what happened so then she explained to me what happened to me to us and then over the years i've had more and more re- recalling of the incident mm. so like i recall like i was planting a garden with beans i loved the soil and i'd ask my mom to give me remember the experiment they give in school where they give these seeds and then you have to sprout them in yep. a jar so i'm planting these seeds now in the ground because i'm like mom now what do we do is a forest in the jar she tells me she pl- prepares a garden for me and the garden was right outside the servants quarter and he was taking a shower and he just opened the door and he was naked and he called me in and i went instead of running away ah! <laughs> i went oh so in the oh i called my sister come come and then whatever happened happened and then it, i would wait for my mom to go to go then i would go to him in the evening or i'd wait for that time right after supper before bedtime when mom is watching tv and everyone else is like distracted and then i'd go so i kept going back and my sister's one who stopped and shit happened but then i forgot about it completely so now i'm asking my sister is when now she explained to me and then i got sad getting the memory of the number of times i kept going back to him have to so the, as the parent of a 6 year old i realized that i needed to start dealing with my trauma um mental health has started becoming something that we were more and more aware of and i was working on radio so i was doing late night capital and i was able to delve into a lot of these topics um just based on the talk radio show that i was doing at the time then i did a course in counseling and psychology at amani counseling center because i felt that i needed the the tools to be able to speak to my audience while i was on radio and through that process and also through now the therapy i received there's been a huge a tremendous um amount of healing that has has occurred yes. Yeah. yeah and of yes. course through the meditation yeah. yeah yeah it's beautiful to to hear there is healing the events definitely unfortunate yes um it's a busy bing pong podcast uh so yeah we we sort of find lessons even when like yeah. we get moments and seasons no it's the the the, the silence and all is fine um but I know maybe it's not my place to say this but uh, masculine energy 
for me feels like I also need to say I'm sorry. Yeah, pole, pole for what happened. So let's go to high school. Is this there? Like, is it totally blocked? I'm a Sasani drama and let's go. If it is, let's jump into you getting into drama. So in high school, okay, remember I don't remember any of this stuff, right? Yes. So this is not even a story that I'm carrying in my mind. Yeah, till I'm later just, in life. Still later in life. Yeah. So at this point, they had thrown me. This is how I, this is my story goes like this. My traumatic story goes like this. I didn't do well in KCP. And actually I got, I think it was four, not 423, 410. And I think it was out of 500 or 600. And I was called Tungara Girls. And mom did not want me to go Tungara Girls. So she took me to Kahuya Girls, which was like the Kenya High of Moranga. But I had this strict upbringing where I wasn't allowed to leave the compound, to go play with friends, to go spend the night at anyone's friend, at anyone's house too. So I'd never left home. I'd never been away from my my people. I'd never slept maybe in one cousin's house one night out of the, the year that Christmas night because the folks got drunk, you know. So now for the first time I'm alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's also like for the first time you have like the ability to make decisions for yourself which is now the pleasure of high school. <laughs> so I wanted to be in everything. I wanted to play basketball because I had the height. And then I wanted to be in the drama club because of trips, right? So you're just trying any way just to get on a trip. So I started playing <laughs> basketball. And then basketball, you have to do like the long distance running mm-hmm. and all that. The sprints, yeah. Shit, that's just not fun. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to go for the trips, you yeah. know? So while basketball training was happening, the drama festivals are happening the same term. Remember? So faster. Yeah, yeah, faster. So then we were told to choose. You can't be in basketball and drama at the same time. So then I chose drama just because it had easier hours. You don't have to wake up at four o'clock to go pro- mm. cross country. But I would still be in the drum, uh, the basketball extended team. Mm. So I'd still go for the trips Pleasure. when drama was <laughs> not happening. And when I joined drama, there was this amazing teacher called Miss Mwingi. And she just, first of all, I mean, Kahuhia girls, which is like the shags of shags, pit latrines with maggots. And I'd never seen a maggot until I got to Kahuhia girls. You're sleeping in dormitories that are like 40 people in one space. You know the, the noise and the, energy of all these women and they used to they just used to mix us up and the only reason i didn't get monolized was because i had an older cousin so I, at least i was safe in that way and also i got a, a good um chore like mm. duty was to clean the outside of the dorm as opposed to cleaning the pit latrine which is what all form ones get but it was so traumatic <laughs> this experience <laughs> of being thrown in shags coming from kuna yes Ngumo. Ngumo. <laughs> yeah. then the food First of all, it's like this, it looks like a dog bowl. Remember that chuma yeah, bowl? Yeah, yep, yeah. It the looks prison like, ones. Yeah, it's the, it's the <laughs> same one that yeah. you feed your dog in at home. <laughs> then it has, at its, that's meat. And you're looking, it's just water. <laughs> and then you see three brown things sort of like picking out at you. At, you know, you're like, how is that meat? Ugali that has the powdery stuff inside and, and lumps. boiled cabbage. Yeah. And lumps and boiled cabbage. I didn't eat. I was just like, this ain't my shit. <laughs> No. So I remember <laughs> telling my parents to bring me Weetabix and m- milk. Yeah. That long life milk. Yeah. I had a whole box of Weetabix and long life. And I ate mm-hmm. Weetabix. So I went from, I showed you the picture of me nice and round mm-hmm. to like folding my skirt and pinning it on the side like yeah. that in one term. It still didn't get my parents to transfer me. Wow. I said my mom was hard. So I was thinking that the skinnier I get, they beat me in Kahuya to eat. The skinnier I get, the more my parents will feel, oh, yeah. poor girl, yeah. she's suffering. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so I did all my four years there. But those four years mm. really honed me. Because when I got into Miss Mwingi's arms, she started to work on us from script writing to pro- setting up props to scheduling rehearsals to creating the costumes to 
creating the dance routine so mm. she she and i think she'd studied drama in new york because she had this wing and she was the only teacher in muranga who had a wing so we would, and she was young in her like mid 20s and she just looked like she smoked we could just tell yeah. so it's a smoker <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we just clung on to her and she taught us drama for the next 4 years which was mm. like the highlight of my school life because in first time it was the drama festivals and then in third time was the interhouse festivals so you have to create everything from writing the script to um uh creating the set and all the costumes and all the props and directing directing and mm. the routines because you had to add music i played a lot of male roles because i was tall um which also of course that that's good for stretching your acting muscles for sure so i played a pastor who had molested these girls in high school mm, mm, mm. i played and then i go completely crazy i played a kikuyu man who was going around the village looking for beautiful girls to marry you know just those two i played i danced in the chorus mm-hmm. were you writing these scripts or were you part of the team all of it all of it everyone had to be involved at every stage of step of the way so even if you didn't write the script this term you would have to write it the next year so everyone had to do so i wrote scripts i created i loved creating dance routines even in usiu that's what i did as we set up a dance group and all i did was choreograph dance routines and then we do the routines practice them and perform them so i've always enjoyed dancing and performing and we got to do everything that had to do with creating a stage performance yeah um <coughs> so miss mwingi and everything that she brought to your life did did that sort of make life better for you despite the three lumps of meat <laughs> <laughs> i think that was the highlight of yeah. my life and you know the yeah, funny thing is as a human being you are just prone to adapt if you don't adapt you perish yeah that's evolution that's, that's what evolution is so yeah. you you f- you find your ways of surviving inside by form 2 or by even form 1 third term you've organized yourself completely you have your booze closet in the ceiling you've got your group of pals who have a hookup who brings fries from outside you know you have the things that you need mm. you have your friends from nairobi you found them you've got your system you've stashed it somewhere so that you can play music so you've already formed your clique and you've already settled into a certain kind of life and within that life you start to create the things you desire so in that way i flourished and thrived in kahuya mm. plus the drama of course because then that was for me the thing that showed me that i have talent i can do this and i really enjoyed that yeah and miss mungi was for a, a, a big inspiration and a big role model in my life in fact i was looking for her the other day and i found out that mumbi kaigo and her are really good friends and she lives in tanzania Makes sense. so we've been like Amazing. Hallowing each other. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Miss Mwingi. Miss Mwingi. Yeah, for all the lovely work that you did. And and other than uh, in this chapter of your Kahuhia days, other than the drama and you learning that actually I can do this, I can adapt to these situations and thrive in them. Uh, are there any lessons that come to mind about th- from those four years that maybe uh, you carry with you to date? Yeah, like <sighs> when i walked into kahuya i thought i was different and special and better than you know and you find that you need people and relationships are for me what have become the most important thing in my I've, i i knew that relationships were the most important thing in my life because they're what kept me alive they're what kept me connected to people because i felt very disconnected and communicating relation in your relationships is also important because mm. a lot of the time we didn't have phones so you had to have you had to keep in touch by writing letters back in the day yeah. and maybe that's what also honed my creativity the re- letter writing you have to write like you have to be very descriptive about the things or the experiences you go through but it also makes you very creative i became a poet in that school Um I found out that in every difficult situation there's always good that comes out of it like life is not going to dish you like a platter of bad then a platter of good it's going to be like all intertwined mm. in that mix and you have to open yourself up to whatever experience you're in 
yeah. at whatever moment you're in. So the moment I opened myself in Kahuhia, I had to, I just lived this really fun teenage life in Kahuhia. I had boyfriends, you know, I had girlfriends as well. Mm. Hello. Yeah. yeah. I also discovered my interest in women in Kahuhia. Mm. <laughs> so nice to say that <laughs> <laughs> discovered and developed and developed mm. yeah so mm. kahuya was awesome it came with a lot of lessons yeah clearly. it was it was a life well lived yeah yeah when i was done i was done i've never gone back by the way ever yeah ever oh, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> anyway it's a yeah. beautiful season clearly despite everything um so um, we are now at uh, 18 19 20 right yeah uh, so do we shift immediately into like the campo days um, uh, are we thinking ah what to do with life what, what's going on around 18 19 20 so i finished um just be- one month shy of my 18th birthday yeah and I just wanted to do performing arts. I just want to do theater arts. I want to do drama. This is what I want to study. There's nowhere to study it unless you get called to Nairobi Uni. And even Nairobi Uni, I didn't even, I didn't even think it was a degree. I think it was just a, a like one of the courses that they offered. Like, mm. but it wasn't. There wasn't. Was I don't know yeah. if there was a degree in theater arts. I didn't pass to be called to Nairobi University. So then my dad was going through like, um, like he was in debt. They were not telling us that we were financially in trouble. You know how parents just never used to give you any information. And my dad couldn't afford to take me to Australia to study at Edith Corn. What you wanted, yeah. Which is what I really, 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 really wanted to do. And he sees sense in me studying business because I can start a business. Yeah. I've never started a business <laughs> in my freaking life, you know? So... The compromise is that, because I wanted to dance for Safari Cat. I was like, when I got to USIU, I found out about Safari Cat at yeah. Safari Park. And I was like, oh my God, I want to audition for Safari Cat. And my dad was like, you are not going to go on stage with you. Have your fucking thigh out for the world to see. Mm-hmm. So he sees an advert for the Phoenix players. And he's like, oh, shut up, shut up, shut up. It's a serialized theater. Go on, audition here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I go for the audition. And James Falkland and J- George Mongai are there. All like English fire and class, and you know they audition a, um, a lo- huge bunch of us, and I got yeah, in. Yeah, let's put a timestamp here. Yeah, when are we talking? Nineteen ninety-six. Ninety-six. Because I cleared cool. in ninety-five. This is ninety-six. Okay. So now I have theater to do, right? So I'm in the theater. We're practicing from the moment where this was like in April. Mm-hmm. We rehearsed for six months with M- Melanie. Okiwumi, Akiwumi, who was this um, dance choreographer from the UK. And she had worked in theaters in London. And she took us through a very vigorous, ask me, Charles Kiaria, Lona Irongo was in this play, Ian Bogo was in this play, Katono, TK Kinan. I mean, a lot of like... Yes. <laughs> For me, it's legend <laughs> upon legend. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we did this, it, we rehearsed for six months and then we did two months of this musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor wow. Dreamcoat. And mm. it was just like Speak Their Names where I had to play a multiple of characters. And then I was also Lona Irongo's understudy. Uh, and unfortunately, she had an attack of lupus because she had lupus at the time. Mm. So then I had to get on stage for a speaking role, which is almost impossible at Phoenix for your first play. That's why you do the musical so you can be a chorus girl. Mm. And play without lines. And then now maybe they'll give you one, two lines. But now I had this whole character to prepare. And of course that propelled me to another level of acting. Because now it's not just singing and dancing. It's also performing a character. So after that I did... uh, Dedan Kimathi. And then... the, The Ambassador's Mistress. I think that's what it's called. And then all girls together. All girls together. All girls together. Look at that. Phoenix. Yeah? Yeah. Let's talk about this season. You've just mentioned stars, Mazi. We can't just, just we can't just roll over that I and know. keep going. Um I know. you're now on the spotlight, yeah? Mm-hmm. A leading role. 
Um, uh, well, yeah, okay. Or at Spot least a speaking role. A speaking role. Mm-hmm. Let's do the A window, leading please. role, because if it was Lona Irongo's role, then that was a leading freaking role, because Lona was the star. She was the now the Nini Washara of now those days, <laughs> yeah? So I, I'm the Lona Irongo of nowadays, let me say that. Hey. So she, it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, if you met Jimmy Gatho or Lona, it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, like that. So it was a leading role. It was. And it was quite intimidating because to play after, like, I can imagine how intimidating it would be for a new actress to have to play for me as Franchetta. Oh, Nini, say, come, you are understudy, play Franchetta. It was like, oh my God, I can't do it like that, you know, so. I questioned every aspect of myself as an actor. I didn't think I could act, but I had a fantastic director, James Falkland and George Mongai as well. And, you know, they were all about like self believing in yourself as a performer and building that belief so that even if you don't get an applause or even if you don't get the accolades and you don't get the money and you don't get the recognition, you as a performer know that you are good. And that's what they that's what they built. That's what they developed technique and skill, skill. so that you know what you're doing when you're there, you know, and I performed and I freaking loved it. Oh man. Oh man, I love it. <coughs> Especially because I see how all these les- uh, lessons you guys were given sort of trickled down to us. Yeah. So maybe we wouldn't have been taught as directly as you guys, but working with you and like the uh, GMs and all, yeah. we'll call, oh man, they're still giving us these notes. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So size to call early 20s. Yes. How is how is you walking around Nairobi and hopefully people going, I know you from somewhere. How are you taking all this No, in? no, no, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Okay. So I was still like just a girl in Nairobi. Ah, you know, okay. just to be a girl in Nairobi. I miss that sometimes. Just be a girl in Nairobi, just doing my thing. So now I'm in USIU. I'm wearing my tumbo cuts, my mini skirts. You know, I'm fighting with my dad about I want to go to the club. I want to party. Charisma gave me the opportunity to go to the club because we started performing in clubs. My dad fucking hated that so much because he was like, you're going to meet an older man and you're going to get into trouble. Women in who are dancers are prostitutes. He had all these weird ideas, even after he had signed me up to Phoenix. So we were, there was that thing that was happening between my dad and I, where he'd be like, you're drunk and I'm not drunk. You're high and I'm not high. But this it's the high of the performance you know that buzz ah, that you live with? Yeah. Then you get into the car and you're like, and your dad has come from a day of work and he's been drinking in the club. It's a different frequency. It's a different frequency. So him is looking at me and he's thinking, you're high on some shit. And me, I'm like, I'm not high. I'm just, the play was so good. The funny thing is it was like a tug of war. He doesn't want it for me, but he, I want it. So he wants what I want for myself. You know, it's like, like, okay take it but he doesn't want this kind of life for me because he thinks that you see my dad was those is those guys who he's afraid of me talking to do you understand mm-hmm. he's that guy so wow, see, wow. oh so yeah. because he's that guy he thinks i'm the girl who's being confused by the guy so he comes at me with his sh- shit accusing me of that shit but it's now in my 40s that i get it i didn't get it then back then yeah then it was like what's this man talking about you know like your eyes are red yeah i had to wash makeup from the egyptian days and you know it was like eyeliner those days for like there was only one black eye pencil i think it was not even diana that was like shoe polish Mm. and then there was no facial cleanser so we used to use cousins to wash our faces after the show so you can imagine how red your eyes are after you've washed Mm. makeup from your eyes (laughs) and then you you still high from you're still high maybe you've had a beer at the bar yeah because that's what happens when you leave the bar someone will buy you a drink but a beer not five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also the high of like of whatever you just talked about. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. About the performance. So you even now when I when I perform, I can't go straight home and get into bed. I have to have a, a nightcap with even if it's some of the actors or the director. You must have something to switch off. But then you come out and zzz, but I don't have the language to explain that to my dad. My dad is just seeing this high animal in his moti. She must be drunk. So we start having these little two tiffs. And so it becomes this tug of war where he wants me to stop this thing that I'm doing because it's just bad. I'm being a bad girl. 
And the power I learned, the power of your words as a father, you will speak upon your child's life, the destiny that will be theirs. Because I got into trouble. I met an older guy. I got pregnant. Everything my dad was talking to me about doing, which I wasn't doing, happened. Indeed. And I'm always like, oh my God, that's my phone. Oh God. Just, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> So from there, it was just downhill. It was just like I was on this and then I just wow, that's how it felt. Like my life just went south. From what moment? From, from the pregnancy the, moment? From the pregnancy moment. Okay. I met a guy when I was at a club dancing with charisma and he was an older guy. And let me tell you, if you have girls who are young, you guy, you have not got an opportunity to get away from this guy. The way he just hits on you, you don't have a, you just even like, you don't have a chance to get away. So he just kept coming at me and he kept coming at me and he kept coming at me and we went off to the coast and he treated me well. Then he turned out to be a violent idiot. So I broke up with him, but now I was pregnant. Then I'm like, okay, I can keep this child. I want to keep this baby. Now I'm, I'm 19 years old, almost 20. I'm going to keep this child. I go and see my doctor. I'm like, he tests me. I'm, then he's, I say, I want to keep the child. I see the family doctor. I tell him, don't tell my dad because they play golf together. Then I want to keep this baby. So he tells me, you wait until you're over three months old. Pregnancy, then you go tell your folks because then you can't have an abortion. An, an abortion. Mm -hmm. huh, who is my dad? <laughs> Marry the man who made you pregnant. Because oh. I went and I sat down with them and I responsibly said to them, I want to have this baby. And he was like, no, you're too young. I was too young. You can't have, this is crazy. You're crazy. Get rid of it. So I got rid of it. And it was the most traumatic experience. And that changed. It's like, that's like, you know how you get to a moment in your life where you're like, if I had chosen this road, what would have happened? It feels like that was a crossroad in my life. And I made a choice that broke me at my core. Or did I make the choice or was I given permission to make a bad decision and there was no care and consideration given to me? And I think that's where most of the trauma that I have had to deal with, even into adulthood, came from that moment because there were, we didn't, there was no therapy. There was no communication about what's happening. There was just like, it was just the worst experience of my freaking life. And then it's just, I can't even explain. Like that was just like a stop. I feel like then that washera died away and then somewhere in that shit, this woman came out. Mm. And... Uh, <laughs> what's, what's this woman like, the woman who's coming out? Not coming out. The woman who's come out is just like, like I've carried this weight yeah. with me, this pain with me, this... Yeah heartbreak with me this anger with me you know this like lack of forgiveness for my father towards my father for what he did it changed our relationship it changed my life as well because i left acting i stopped going to phoenix i ran away from home i went off to tanzania with this guy and some friends sarah moihaki alan oyugi we tripsed down to tanzania to look for greener pastures uh, we're looking, we're trying to do our internship because I quit USIU. I was very depressed. I had to go to college according to my mom. You can't sit in the house. You can't sit in bed. Just pick a course, pick a course. I want to do acting. I want to do drama. I want to do drama. That's not going to happen. So do TV and film production. So I did TV and film production. So now I'm looking for my internship. So now I'm 21. So I wasted a year of my life in, I can't tell you what happened when I was 20 years old other, other than I was depressed and I quit university and I was recovering from the shit I had done to myself at 19. So I lost this year. So now I'm 21. <laughs> I can't remember what the year of that year when I was 20 mm. was. And I'm in Tanzania. I know I was in college when I was 20 at the media network, but I can't remember much of it. I was in this haze. I meet this guy. I'd also done beauty therapy. So my mom, it was so crazy. So after the depression, when I got into depression, as a way for her to get me out of depression, she starts forcing me to do these courses. So she, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Me, I want to do acting. And then she's like, no, why don't you do makeup and beauty? You know, it's close enough. <laughs> huh? 
<laughs> so she signs me up for a six month course at Bodyways and I start going and I'm going through maybe this is what was happening when I was 20 years old and then I try working as a beautician I meet this guy who's a DJ then I don't like the working as a beautician because I don't give service like imagine manicures pedicures facials that's like gross I just that's not my work as a human being bless you if you do that job I was grossed out completely so now it's like do TV and film production because you can't just be sitting at home doing nothing so I go and I do TV and film production so it feels like a lot of my 20s instead of like focusing on this thing that happens where you you blossom and start making decisions about what where you planning your life what I want my adulthood to be like what I want to pursue mm-hmm. how to save money when I want to move out when that's what 20 year olds are doing I'm recovering from an abortion without any therapy I'm dealing with depression and being told what to do so I didn't guide myself I just did and did like going through the motions of doing what your parents say you should do and so I feel that gap even now in my 40s I feel that loss of of maturity like I missed that stage in life there's a lot of stuff I'm catch I have to have had to catch up in my 40s that I missed that when I ask my older sister or my younger sister but when did you plan when I was in college when I was in college me I was like huh eh? mm-hmm. me I don't know what you guys are mm. talking about cuz me I was just in recovery and in trauma and in self judgment and self hatred and so after the tv and film production my dad and i have not reconciled since the abortion so it because a point i realize i can't stay with this man anymore and i leave i go with my i go to tanzania but i go with my friends just so i can tell my mom but i'm going with sarah and i'm going with alan and she's like okay fine tell me when you get to da these are the days for letters and phone mm. calls remember so i get to da and i'm like fuck you and i go just having frolicking in the fun of being a free 21 year old girl without my dad telling me what to do that my mom telling me what to do now i can live and this man was just horrid ugh bashira was just such a terrible choice in life by the way i mean he had no clue what he wanted with his life he was just a dj who was just waiting for something to be given to him so he and he had a very traumatic childhood i think he had a very violent father a drunk father and he had been abandoned and he had grown up as a relative from shags with a very rich family mm-hmm. so with that kind of chip on his shoulder and not being recognized he was very insecure and now it's me and him pretending we're a couple like adulting in tanzania we have no clue what we're doing we're living in a seven quarter he's djing but he's djing in the shittiest clubs clubs i can't even go to now he gets starts getting rageful and insecure and he starts getting violent and then i leave him and then i go and start living alone and i have never taken care of myself and i have no income other than i'm doing my internship at DTV you have to talk to these producers to get you camera work so that you can be paid a g mm-hmm. so that you can eat i'm not talking to my parents i'm not telling anyone how i am i've literally run away and shut out the world at some point i meet another guy i start dating him he starts stealing from the company he's working for i mean like my choice in men seriously then <laughs> i break up with this guy who's stealing from his company and go back to the guy who i'd initially come to tanzania with Why? swashira guy and i get pregnant so now i'm in double the fucking trouble i'm like i can't be pregnant with this guy we live in an sq i've had a pretty good upbringing me this guy will take me nowhere you know how something happens where you're just given brain suddenly by god the child comes you're given brains <laughs> <laughs> Start thinking about these things like how will I raise a child with this guy how will I live with this guy maybe, sorry maybe that's the sahani that comes with the baby yeah that is the sahani my mom says it's this protective shield that just like god and the angel just put this protective shield around you cuz let me tell you i was the most joyous pregnant woman i've like i was at my happiest but i had to leave him this guy i had to find a way to leave him and at this point he's taken my travel documents he's just being a downright a hole and i'm pregnant so i'm not the same person i can't stand his smell he's getting more and more insecure he's getting more and more violent i managed to f- somehow manipulate the situation where 
he has he couldn't let me come to Nairobi alone. I think he knew that I was going to leave him. Mm. So he brings me to Nairobi and he sort of imprisons me in his friend's house. And it was a very weird situation because he took me to a girlfriend who has kids. So she's a single mom. So how she saw mad the situation, she quickly locked me in the room, kicked him out of her house, gave me 20 bob, told me, "Go to your mother." I took a mat and I went home. I have not been seen at home for like one and a half years at this point. Yeah. yeah? Is the pregnancy visible? No, cuz it was just like maybe 3 months. Okay. Or four months. Mm. So no. And then you hide you can you know how to Yeah. Tent it with clothes, yeah. But I, my mother, she was just like, "Are you pregnant?" It didn't even take her three days, by the way. Mm. She had asked me. So Hash just said, "You can stay here, but when that baby is born, must find work, must provide for your own baby, but you can live here as long as you want. You will always have a roof over your head, you always have food to eat." So it was a very safe space to come back to, and I didn't even tell her what the drama was with Washira. It was a most amazing pregnancy. Most peaceful time of my life, most joyful time of my life. Like I felt just zen. Then I had my daughter. Then I had to look for a way to make a living. So I went, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do in Nairobi? You just go back to where you started. Yeah. So I went to the to Phoenix. You know. yeah. mm. And that's when I did Dad and Kimathi and all girls together back to back. So there was a huge gap And then I also auditioned for Dangerous Affair and got ah, into my first movie. There you go. Yeah. yeah. That's when I got onto screen. Yeah. And it came out of necessity. I'm a single parent. This is one thing I know. So I'm just going to go back to the thing I know. Mhm. Yeah. Mm. A couple of things. A couple of things. I'll take two. I know you probably yeah. have 10. Uh, <laughs> let me take two. Number one. Um dad's reaction when you come home. Dad, oh, oh. Who is your dad in all this? I just exed that story. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So it was crazy. See, we were going through like financial shit. Yeah. And now he's in debt. Now they're coming after the house. We've already been auctioned. So he makes a plan to go to the States in like the same month that I have run away and gone to Tanzania. He left that August and went to the States. And I didn't know because I didn't contact home. So when I came back he wasn't there. For Raiden, that's how I was allowed to keep my baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you do you think in some way this has softened your mom's heart? I mean, I think age softens a person's heart. Ah. Just But also I feel like you start to see your even you as a, as a young parent you will start to change your parenting technique or tactics based on the child's response you see you give birth to a person this person is not empty they're a full human being when they're born and they have a personality mm. so you might start off spanking your kid then you realize i this kid can't be spanked this kid is not a kid for being spanked this kid is a kid for being spoken to and being punished like go to your room or no playing with a you just read your child read the response then you start making you know yeah. changes according yeah. to the child that you're raising so that's what happened um yeah can can i tell you a funny story yeah. uh, sorry i love that because i actually didn't think that that was a thing until i remember that my wife and i one of the jokes that we make which is a bit serious is our kids have a, like a love language that maybe is prebuilt in them i don't know where that comes from i i don't know if we can maybe take out the part of nature versus nature mm-hmm. in terms of how maybe how that develops but i'm like maybe at a very tender age there are some things that are already naturally they're just uh, yeah. i don't know they like they're like they're full beings especially you wait your six month old starts to have an opinion that's different from this other one or starts <laughs> to say no where this one always where said that yes from? Mm-hmm. you realize ah oh, yeah this child is already complete you're the one who messes them up You're the one who comes and you start putting you must you must you must but yeah. when your child comes they come to you you they have their likes they have their dislikes they have their moral compass they have their value system that's based on them because even from a very young age they will tell you what they don't like they will be uncomfortable they will want things to be done certain ways they will have already a personality that is true 
um, how much of that is genetic and from like a an eastern philosophical point of view how much of that is a reincarnation i know mm. i know because there are so many similarities when you think about like especially in kikuyu culture with the naming yeah i'm very much like my shoshu <laughs> but she was alive when i was born so that's another another thing about do you actually need to die for your self to be reborn into this same dimension that you're in maybe that's okay. the gene part maybe there's some encoding that we've not discovered yet in the gene he, so maybe that maybe that's what would explain the similarities between a person who's alive who's still in this realm and so the similarity between them and someone who's still in the same realm mm. but then there are so many other things that you can not explain about your kids they like that's not the mom that's not the grandmother yeah. that's not the grandfather mm-hmm. that's just them who is it it's them but then now this maybe that's the element so if we take that causal part break it out into mm-hmm. two maybe that's the part that comes from reincarnation i don't know maybe. these are just wild thoughts anyway but keep going with your story that's actually my, my kid sorry um I a, it's a joke my kid my firstborn son his punishment because you, sp- you spoke about it even like when you th- maybe sort of like do this threatening thing which i i, I don't think is, is is enjoyable but you have to t- sometimes um or even sometimes like pinch him whatever right that doesn't get to him mm. the moment you take away quality time not with gadgets with his parents like go to your room the guy <laughs> cries he's like this is the end of, of the, the world, world yeah. of the world to him <laughs> yeah. you pinch him I'm like, whatever else like try any other you know stick yeah. yeah any stick like like uh, yeah any punishment none no. of none, none of it will work so and no. imagine you thought a tactic was this parenting skill you had mm. and it's not working on the child you have yeah so i feel like my mom realized that this is wisdom yeah oh this way of raising didn't work let me see how this works mm. let me see if i'm if i'm more loving if i'm more understanding so i think the one thing that she dedicated herself to was just being there for us like you don't have to be you don't have to believe what i believe but i think that came out of necessity yeah these are my daughters and this is what they're presenting so i must love them as they are yeah she's still very strict in her own way and there's a lot of like times i just like want to like like squish her like a cockroach but she's my mom and she's been there for us yeah. through thick and thin but we still like have our if she had the, the capacity it would be the belt to my bum you know the way she, eh, they should she what she say <laughs> <laughs> she could she would still with me yeah yeah, yeah that's beautiful uh come on sorry w- one last thought yeah, uh, just the openness to learn from your mom mm-hmm. is also an amazing that's thing beautiful it's a beautiful thing wait are you where your mom was like a- age wise you and your daughter now are you exactly where you were with your mom back then No my mom was 3 years older. Ah okay that would have been a eh, serendipity. I know. Yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> hey okay. Like I, the play we did do like you know that did. speak their names Bran is 33 I'm 44 Sylvie is 55. Holy shit I'm 33. Oh. Look at that. And we were doing a witch's play. Like serendipity. I know. Yeah. Like if you're into numerology tell us what the fuck that means man 44 <laughs> 33 times 2. Yeah. Then 44 and then 55. Damn. Hey, hi. Let's keep going with this journey <laughs> before we sasa venture in any other way. We are here for the stories. Yeah. We are here for the lessons. Dangerous affairs. Oh. Is this when people start recognizing you on the road? Uh, do many more gigs come after that like immediately? Immedi- are you saying yes. no to more? Let's I mean, it's not really about. no to more, but it's yeah. more like You know how this industry works it's almost like when this thing uh, folds another thing opens mm. and it's there's not really like five things open it's normally just one thing that opens up for you but what happened with dangerous affair is it was hugely successful because of even the marketing strategy which was let's take these actresses about the town and let them meet their fans or let's give these actresses the video tapes to go sell the movies themselves so you meet a lot of your fans but then there's also a gap there that I've completely forgot you know in between uh dangerous affair had I done dangerous affair I hadn't done dangerous affair yet this was just after I finished breastfeeding I started baking cookies and muffins and selling them 
in Nairobi. So I'd bake them at home, I'd take them to town, I'd go office to office, knocking on office doors and selling these cookies and muffins. And I'm this beautiful girl. So of course you're going to buy cookies and muffins from me. And I met so many people. Then I got a job as a production manager through that cookie and muffin thing in film mm. studios, imagine. Mm -hmm. Again. And it was just word of mouth. It was like, you have my cookies and muffins, you tell me, go see my friend in Kenyatta, on Kenyatta Avenue. I start taking to her, go see my friend in Westlands. I start taking to you, go see my friend in film studios like that. Because what are the odds? I know. Ending up at film studios. Ending up at film studios. And ah. remember, I had studied at film studios at Media Network. So now I'm a production manager at film studios. Then I get my first ad, which was fudge. No, not fudge. Not my first ad. Mm. My second ad. My first yeah. ad was fudge. Was McLean's. Yes. Then there was a fudge when I was 18 years old and I'm pleating my friend's hair. And then this guy pulls up in a kamoti. I don't even know what that called. I used to play <laughs> at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> then we're like, hey, who's that guy? Who's that guy? I can't remember what. what and then I don't know who gives who chocolate. <laughs> yeah, <this is> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get another ad, a Safaricom ad where I'm sitting on Mudamba's. He's my Mudamba, boss and I'm Mudamba. sitting on his lap. Why am I sitting on Odamba's lap? And I think something <laughs> about the, the the topic of the boss and the secretary, they didn't actually ever air that uh, that commercial. Oh, yeah. But then I get on into, and that's what I got when I was working for Stevie Price. Then that's how I hear about the audition. Ah. Because once I was in back in the production world, I hook up yeah, with Akina. Akina, Alex, Kamau, Big Ideas. We're doing all these short movies at the time as well, just like Friends. Like how you guys are here just doing this stuff mm. and then suddenly she'll be this big shot director with huge budgets from Hollywood and she'll be like, yo, my girl, Nini, I got a story for you. I'm going to play you $20 million. That's what you're going to do for me. Okay. I'm, I'm a bit stoned right now. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> So, so through those, it's like networking. Yeah. So they take, we, we're just hanging out. All right, it's an audition. I go, that's how I got into Dangerous Affair. From Dangerous Affair, I just start calling. I was like, I want to get on radio. I met this amazing journalist called Declan Walsh dancing in a disco. And he saw me and he came to me and he was like, you're the girl from the film. Mm -hmm. And then we became boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> 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 then as we're boyfriend and girlfriend, he asks me, so, because now I'm, I'm just sitting in the house, twiddling my thumb, waiting for another audition. Then he's like, what else do you want to do apart from acting? I'm like, I want to go on radio. And he's like, why don't you just get a, call all the radio stations and tell them, you're Nini Washara from the movie Dangerous Affair. <gasps> really? You can do that? Yeah. So I call. Hi, John Wilkins. Can I speak to John Wilkins? It's Nini Washara from the movie Dangerous Affair. I call Kiss. I call Capital. Call everyone. Call everyone. Kiss finally allowed, not even finally, I was just told come for a voice test like on Saturday. So I go do a voice test. I meet John Wilkins, who's like checking me out, checking out my legs. But anyway, I get a job. No, a job. <laughs> I get trained as a radio <laughs> presenter <laughs> at Kiss. Let's by... timestamp this. What is this? 2002. Yeah, okay. 2002, right? So now I'm on radio. I've done Dangerous Affair. I get a call from Nation TV. Hey, ni mimi naitwa Kisem White na fanya kazi na NTV. Niko na script hapa ningependa sana usome. Inaitwa Wingu la Moto. So then we meet and we do a pilot. And it's me Sarah Muhaki again from Dangerous Affair, Benta mm -hmm. and Esther Kahuha. We go off, we do the pilot. That's in 2002. In 2003 we start filming in Gulamoto. Takes off. Yeah. Takes off. And then off. that's where the fame came in. So now double that Wingulamoto story, which is nationwide with now Capital FM. I mean, Kiss FM, Saturday. I had a Saturday morning show. From there, I get hired by Capital FM to do Late Night Capital, which was perfect because then my daytimes I can act. And at night I have a job and this is the job that's like maintaining the life and mm -hmm. I have to pay for school fees and I have to pay rent and I have to buy food. And so the job pays for that. And then all this other extra money is for the holidays. I didn't even think about investing. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, how, how do you know, if at all, that you want to get into radio? How did I know? Yeah. I, I just thought. You just thought? Okay. I was like, what else do I want to do? What else do I want to do? But I always wanted to, I'd always loved listening to Capital FM, there was this guy, Phil freaking Matthews. The legend. The bleeding freaking legend. And Farid Kimani, I think, came shortly after that. Was it Farid? 
Yeah. Farid because when I joined, Farid is an OG like that. Yeah. Eh? Mm-hmm. Farid was the then PC. And he was PCing, in, he'd, I don't think he liked the job of being PC. And I didn't have the kind of accent that Linda Holt wanted. So that's why I went to Capital, because mm. I was just told you, you're just too much of a shaggy girl. You can't work for us. So, but Farid said, you wait, you wait. This management is switching, come back in a year. And when I came back in a year, Chris Kirubi is, was a friend of the family from golfing. So I just went to see my dad's pal. <laughs> I am God, Chris. I want a job. Go and tell Somoina she's a new PC. <sighs> and Somoina was my friend in Capital and was with me at, in Consolata. Mm-hmm. Oh. And we had interviewed on the same day. We had gone to see Chris for the different jobs on the same day. And we had met at Java and we had, hey, hi, hi. So when I went and said, I want the late night Capital slot. You don't want breakfast? No. You don't want drive? No. I just want the late night Capital. Why? I want to talk about relationships. I really wanted to do that to talk about relationships. There's also a presenter who had left called, oh, how can I forget his name? How can I forget his name? No, no, one, no one ever remembers the one who was before Nini. But this is how it'll be. Even me, it'll be like, what was that girl's name? She used to do Late Night Capital. She was so famous. Now I'm dead. This is in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll plug it. We'll Once plug it. Remember, yeah, you remember, just text us. Yeah. We'll write it on the show notes. Oh my God. No pressure. No pressure. It's not your fault that you it don't remember. It was Robert Warubi. Oh yeah? It oh. was Robert Warubi on Late Night Capital. Robert. What the fuck? And I wanted to be the girl version of okay. him. Just like sexy on radio. Mm. Which you are. <laughs> Which you are. We were listening to this. Because how old are we? <laughs> so easy to go around... 18, 18 s- yeah. 17 18 yep. so we are listening <laughs> yeah. to you we're and you're t- like uh, well, to me <laughs> <laughs> well maybe not that <laughs> <laughs> maybe not that but all good. especially because for some of us we, we met the voice then do you, do you see that guilty clearly. laugh no, do, you no. see the, <laughs> do you hear that guilty laugh <laughs> no <laughs> If you know, you know, if I did, I would say it. I know, but I used to get a lot of calls I'm on sorry. radio. Like, yeah. I'm, 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 the reason I'm laughing is because I always like talking to like um, creative that people and yeah. artists. Yeah, you know why? Uh-huh. Because they 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 like they tell a story. No, no. Most of us actually met the met the met the voice. Then the face, because yes. we hadn't watched Dangerous Affair yeah. at 16, 17. So when we watched Wingu Lamoto, and Dioko, oh yeah, that's the chick from Capital. Yeah. 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 And then oh, my man. character in Wingu was like, I swear, I, I just, I, did, I was such a bad girl. I was such a bad girl on Wingo. Were you ever like judged on the on the road of course, interacting with people? People thought that that was who I was. People mm. thought that I was a daddy stealer. I think that I in and I taught an entire generation of girls to for, to to go after older men. Mm. Me, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Like maybe this thing for Ntapata sponsor was based on Suzanne Hello. from Wingula Moto. <laughs> we found the OG. You know, <laughs> we found yeah. kama wio You know, you don't know. Yeah. So if you're not thinking these things, you're just thinking it's a hot role. I'm just going to do my part yeah. to the best of my abilities. But people thought I was that girl. You know, I even won Baddest Girl on TV, the Chago Latinis Award. Oh, snap, a lot is going on. There's yeah. an award like that. Imagine. Yeah. Chago Fanta Latinis. Chago Latinis. Yeah. There's, there's an award Particular. like that. Yeah, Baddest Chagori. Girl on TV. <laughs> yeah. Like, even you can't even that put that dope. on your resume, baby. <laughs> like, bad, but how? Bad, like, good? It's a, like a Razzie. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. But, yo, if you win a, a If you, do, if you, you don't though. win the Razzie, then you won. You know that? Yes. If you win the Razzie, then you've won. lost. Yeah. 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 I get what you mean. <laughs> Baddest oh, girl man. on TV. But I wasn't a bad girl. I was just a girl. Yeah. Just going through the motions of, like, life and but living. seeing chicks like that on screen... I know. Black African chicks. I'm so sorry, girls. That was never my intention. (laughs) Like, I didn't even think about, I just thought about it when I was older. I was like, what did that do? Because especially the number of people who in their 20s tell me that they grew up watching me. 
And then you look at their behavior and you're like, hmm. uh, maybe I have something to do with that. No, <laughs> you're following yeah. your path. So how long do uh, how long do we do this? The balance, the capital and TV balance. So Wingo was from 2003, 2004, I think till 2005 or six. I think we did like three or four years of Wingo Lamoto, which was heaven. And then capital, I left in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was heartbreaking. That was heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Yeah, it's weird. You know, when you're done with a thing, you're just done with a thing. Mm -hmm. It's like how you are done with speak their names when you're wow, done. Wow, wow! Don't go there. Hey, keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, were you were you <laughs> done with radio? Ama, were you done with? Capital? I was just done with capital. I mean, when you, I was so done with capital. It was becoming this place where, initially, it was fun, and then now Chris Kirubi needs to make a profit. So now he's being strict about like how much income each show is bringing and you must then go on another show and you know when you're being derailed from the thing i don't like being told that if i've like this is what i've chosen this is what i've chosen mm. you can't be telling me that the, the choice i've made is not like so i shouldn't do late night i should now be vying for um another slot he, he wanted me either on drive and has got frustrated by the hassle he wants to have my salary because my r show is too late to be it's not making enough as of, profitable of, as yeah. profitable so why are we paying you so much i want a pay rise i just got like so frustrated then there was this new policy where you had to be in the office during the day so now uh, you can't even do your things yeah during the day. i have to be like not asking for permission to then go do my thing which wasn't the plan and i had told him this from the very beginning but now he's the boss so he can change the rules when he feels like i was just done i was just like I'm so done with your story. Mm. And I wanted to get into, to discover, I wanted to see what was behind the scenes. Like what's production about? Mm. I did a workshop with um, One Fine Day Films, a production workshop. And then I became a production manager with Ken TV, which was producing Tabasamu mm. and Nairobi Law at the time. So I PM'd those two shows. And then I went to work for Dreamcatcher to do um, commercials with them. So that's 2010, 2011, 20, yeah, 2010, 2011. And then I get tired because I think I'm just the kind of person who I do a thing, then I'm just done. Then I want another experience and yeah. I'm just done. Then I wanted to get into casting. So I became a casting director in 2011. 2011. Yeah. All along, professionally, super engaged, good times. Where is the baby? The baby is there. Like going back home to you, to you me. and her, Ama, yes. is she back at mom's? No, and with, me, yeah. with me, with me, with me. Because I moved out of home. I stayed with my mother until she was in standard one. So she was six years old. That's 20, 23, 4, 5, 6, 7. 2007 is when I move out of home. Then I, so we're just living, me and her. But mm -hmm. even, even back then, my mom was very clear. Like you just have a roof over your head but the baby's resp the responsibility is yours you can't dump her on your sisters but of course i did many times so kudos to my all my sisters who yeah. b b all bore the brunt of being young parents i'd be like i can't come home i'm in the club <laughs> please make sure money eats you know <laughs> and there are no cell phones so these are landlines yeah only if you can find the landline yeah or sometimes I just didn't come home. But I was always like the parent. But now the naughty nights, I did the naughty nights. I went clubbing and I didn't like leave my child with a nanny. I left my child with my daughter, uh, my sister or my mother. Yeah. But when I moved out now, I had to be quite like now the parent, like the full-time parent. So it was just me and her. So she's in school at uh, Rose of Sharon at the time. Um, and she's joined the Sunflower Kids Club because I assumed as an actress, my child will want I to be well. a performer as well. And she hated it. I mean, she <laughs> loved it as a kid, but hates it now. Yeah, She's a great actress. But I just like raised her. I was doing the parenting thing of coming home. So I'd do the shoot. I had I used to have these fights with directors or producers because I needed to be home between five and eight or six and eight because I had to have dinner with my daughter because that was the only time I could spend with her. If yeah. I'm shooting from morning and working late night, I need at least two hours in the evening with my daughter. And that's what we did, mm -hmm. those two hours. Mm -hmm. And then we'd carpooled with other parents for the morning ride. 
So there's a house help. She gets up. They make breakfast. Um, then I wake up maybe just to say goodbye. Then I get dressed. Then I go to work. She goes to school. I go to work. I shoot. Or maybe I've left at four in the morning. Whatever. Yeah. But she was there. Mm. Like all my twen- my young 20s. Um. I spent all of my adult years just raising her. So this is actually the first time I've been with her. I've been like a single adult because we're not living together now. She's now much older. Mm. It's very strange. She's above 18. She's 21. That's a big, that's, that's a woman. A, that's a woman. Yeah. Mm. Well, at least in the making of Exactly. One. A young Look woman. That. Look at that. So she was always just part of the life. Yeah. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, you know, you get into relationships as a parent, as a single parent, and then you get out of the relationship and that sort of destabilizes your child because you thought it was going to be a long-term relationship yeah. and you introduced her to the guy and then the guy doesn't, you know, ever come back. Mm. So I feel like my daughter has <laughs> been disappointed by men all her life. Ah. All her, like her father, yeah. my father, who was just was never there because mm-hmm. he just went and never came back to the States. And then her father Wait, didn't raise to date? her. To date. Okay. Does anyone know about of his whereabouts? Of course we do. Ah. He's on Facebook and oh. Instagram. <laughs> Man, social media. And he also comes home now. Okay. Uh, but 20 years. It took 20 years 20 for him years to come, to come home. Right. Okay. Yeah, And yeah. he came home, I think, just to like tell us, yo, I've moved on, so... I hope you did too. I hope you guys have moved on too. Yeah. It was quite heartbreaking to lose my dad, by the way. Yeah. I think it's easier if you just disappear, like how my dad just didn't have a dad, than to grow up with this guy and the guy is just like, I've gone to make money to raise my family. And then he's like, oh. Yeah. Where's my dad? I don't know where my dad is. Uh-huh. And then he comes back like 20 years later. Yo, guys, what's up? Uh-huh. How have you been? Yeah. With the world. <laughs> Yeah. How you doing? You're in Burke. Oh. With the Burke. Oh, yeah, because he's lived no, out there for a minute. Yeah. Is, is there a bit of you that, that gets it? No, me, I just resent him. Okay. Then don't be like all boozer with me, by the way. Ah, <laughs> 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 don't go there. Don't go there. Let me just I have would. my moment. <laughs> that's just ideas. Ideas. Let me just have my moment. They're all just ideas. Ideas. Yeah. All just ideas. <laughs> right, so that's the dad yeah. side. Let's go to the daughter side. Are there things in her that you look at and go, oh, sh- this is me? Yeah, like she's very, um, like her, when she has set, she's just got hard head. When she set her mind, you can't change it to something. And then she's very secretive about her life, which is very much like me. Like I don't mean I don't like like telling people what I'm doing. I just go and I do. Then it'll be like, yeah, by the way, I'm doing this. But mm-hmm. I will not be like, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't tell me what's going on in her life. I hate that. I wish she could just be like, mom, my heart is broken. Or mom, I'm falling in love. I have to like, tell me, tell me. So that is very much like me because I didn't may also keep shit to myself. And then she's very independent. And she has to be like at the end of her rope for her to call f- or ask for help. Very much like me, very much like my mother. So she's a strong woman. And sometimes I just want my baby back. That mm. I miss my baby. I, it's an actual thing. Do you know that? Like your child is there, but you miss your baby. Do you know that? Like you just, I wish you were eight years old again. Yeah. I wish you were 10 years old again. We had the most beautiful bond because she wouldn't let me keep anything from her. She's so manipulative. She'd be like, but mom, I'm the only person you have in this world. Oh. If you don't tell me your secrets, who are you going to tell? <laughs> now you tell her, no, 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 no. See, so. you pull the same on her. <laughs> okay, yo, I... Her, she's just like, stop blackmailing me, stop <laughs> manipulating me. I read you from a mile away. Oh, man. Yeah. This age is empowered. This no age way. is so empowered. And she's also at that stage where she's defining her boundaries. It's a very interesting thing to see. I went through the experience as well but i think the availability of parenting information now you can f- see stages so when girls i don't know about boys but when girls are in their 20 is 21 there they start like defining who they are as women and they define with like no no mm. no they're just putting so at 21 22 she's behaving the same way she behaved at two years old mm. when they start learning to say no 
She's behaving the same way. At two years old, they're defining their boundaries. This is who I am. This is what I like. This is what I enjoy. I want mommy here. I want to listen to that. I want to play daddy like that. Mm. They're defining, they're saying what they want. At 22, 21, 22, they're doing the same thing. It's a profound observation. Wow. It's a super profound <laughs> observation. <laughs> okay. To mend the professional trajectory, okay. we've gone the growing up trajectory. And for the professional side, oh, we could go on and on, like all the projects you've either in some way been part of, either from the casting to the actual acting. And, and uh, guys could Google you for hours and end up doing what you are suggesting we would. Yeah, we probably <laughs> would. <laughs> Please so, don't make that noise again. Oh. Let's speak about a couple to. of projects. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not all projects. Let's speak about just a couple yeah. of projects. Okay. One, Please. I hope you ask about what I hope uh, you'll ask. Country Queen. Before that. Before Rafiki? No. Uh -huh. Sense. Sense8? Yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Let's start there. Um, I, okay, so let's start there. Let's talk about a few. I, you don't have to go in details. Just tell us maybe a lesson or two from that or a memory or two from that. Because hey, to the end of the Nini Mashera resume, we'll be uh, here for a minute. Let's talk about Sensei. You spoke, I don't know, were we recording to Kiongi Ajuya? They're casting thousands of people. 5,000. Were we on record? <laughs> No, it wasn't casting. It was, oh. I don't know if we were on Rocket, but we had extras for yeah. the scene, the scene in Uhuru Park. Mm. Um, I actually have a couple of guys I know who, who are in who it. Are in it. Yeah. So because 5,000 is a lot of yeah. guys. Everyone, <laughs> everyone got to be on Sense8. Every everyone. single person. Yeah. Were you on Sense8? No, if you were not by the that's your entire fault as an individual. Is, wow. You were ringing by yourself in the corner? No, I've been in Likwa Theater. I've always been that. Theater but I guy. held my auditions at the Phoenix a Theater. I knew. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't come, Not and at the K and T theater. Yeah, it's so sad that because I think you would have really enjoyed it. So I mean, so first of all, Sense8 was I felt it was the most confusing script we received because we received the Nairobi bits only. Oof. So that's the script you sent. So I'm just like, what the what hell is going, is on, going yeah. on? Because now the Nairobi bits have the other characters, but then you don't know who these other characters yeah, are. Yeah, what's their story? They're coming in and they're leaving. They're coming in and they're leaving, right? And the, or the guy goes, and then now the guy is in Korea, or the guy is in London. You're like, what the hell is happening? How is this? The so going through the casting process, I was working with Carmen Cuba, who is like Stranger Things, the casting director, Mighty Mike, the casting director. Like she's like hey. a brilliant casting director from uh, the Hollywoods. And she had this whole process set up. So she just sends me this document. I was working for Ginger Inc. And Ginger Inc. was a service production house. And that's how I was a casting director because Ginger Inc. pinpointed me as their casting director. And they said, we'll go with her. So I became the casting mm -hmm. director. But I was working with fucking Wachowskis. That's a big deal. That's a big oh. deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. And you're getting notes from, and Tom Tikva, you're getting notes from their peers and their directors oh, are man. telling you what they like and they're sending you voice notes. Nini, so I watched this audition and I liked it like that. So you're just like, oh my God. <laughs> are the guys who did The Matrix. Yeah. The guys who did That's The a Matrix. Big deal. It was the biggest deal ever. Yeah. So I'm on cloud nine, but I'm also going through a very difficult time emotionally. Why was I going through a very difficult time emotionally? I can't remember. But I remember that I was going through a very, like my mental state wasn't at my mm. happiest. And here's an opportunity to audition for roles. But you know, first of all, Sensei had only men. And Chichi. And Chichi. But I want that role. But Chichi had been sold Pre, you know, like when producers are like, "Oh, who's a great actress from Kenya? Could you send us a?" We're trying to present to the t to the network so they can take the film. They want to see a list of your cast from Kenya of your potential cast. So she'd already been presented, and then there's a it's a thing with being brown when you're dealing with <laughs> uh, yeah. when you're dealing with Wazungus and you're a brown African. Yeah. You're not black they enough. Black. They want Lupita and yeah. Chichi black. <laughs> so then there's a there's a thing I go through called color color discrimination, Col colorism. It's a thing. Colorism. colorism yeah. yeah. But now it's a negative. If you're brown and even Japan, oh she's not black enough. She looks like she has white blood. Huh? Yeah, you mm. go through it, Abu, as well. Oh, my. So Chichi got the role, but I was also not in my happiest, most thriving. I think Mind it was, space. oh, I remember. I Now I'm in my 
30s and I didn't get married and I'm going through that thing, socialized, cultural expectations where you've let yourself down. Because I didn't pursue marriage and I'm thinking I'm, I'm in my 30s, I'm an old maid and I went through this depression, which is so ridiculous because uh, you are not an old maid in your 30s. Maybe now you're an old maid. <laughs> 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 So, um, where was I? So this is what is going on. My mental space. My, my mental yeah, space. But yeah. work-wise. But work-wise, it's going great. But yeah. now I want that role. I didn't get that role. Mm. She got that role. Mm. Yeah. Damn. Also, the sun. Of, yeah, colorism. Exactly. And I mm. think I would have been perfect as um, Kafias' mother. Mother. Yeah? Mm. But she, she got it. I no, swear, but, the jealousy you experience <laughs> as an actor. <laughs> you know it, right? When yeah. you audition but for a role. But she did Job. She did a fantastic job, but did I could have done job. the same, yeah. even better. Chichi, I love you. <laughs> I think you're brilliant. But yeah, uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's every actor's desire when they audition for the role to get the role. To get the and role. even though you're kudos for the other actor, you're also like insanely mm, jealous. Like I'm watching Nafsi now and I'm so jealous of Mombi. And I'm like, why are you jealous, Washera? Like this <laughs> was Mombi's movie. It wasn't yeah. yours. But it's just like I could have done that role. So it doesn't take away from the... Oh, look at that. And Mumbai is black I know, as well. As well. She's mm-hmm. dark skin. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. So do you see that she got season two? <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> of Sense8 because... She's... Oh, yeah. But oh, no. yeah. She came back she for came, season two. She yeah. wasn't, she wasn't I remember the, six in, uh, the sex scenes and all. Of course you so, do. Of course I do. <laughs> of course <laughs> I do. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I mean, of course you yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... I mean, f- casting was brilliant because I enjoyed the process of working directly with actors. When mm. you're do- in the casting process, once you and your cameraman have set up the shots, then you can just be acting with all the actors, mm. you know. So every role that comes up, it really stretches, stretched me as an actor and also honed my skill as mm. an actor. So if you're looking at like things destiny sets out for you to better you in the journey that you've chosen for yourself, mm. this was one of the things that injected a lot of skill into my acting. Mm-hmm. But from the casting, Lana loved my voice. And I remember there was this character in season two, Sense8. And I was casting, I was looking for an actor and she just kept telling me, don't, I just don't want to see anybody else. I just don't want to see anybody else. And then when she, when she came to Kenya, she was like, Nini, I love your voice so much. I just want you to be the character. So I became Justice Ab- Abdu. Mm-hmm. So I did get a role, a very small role, not very small role. It was going to be a role in season three, but then the... It took a different direction. Shit. Ah, cool. This is the story behind TV. It's like the longest running series I've been on was Wingula Moto, right? Mm-hmm. But after that, everything I've been on has been cancelled after the first or second season. It's just mm-hmm. like I come... No, let me not say that because yeah, no one's going to hire me. <laughs> I'm and also like, don't put good it vibes, out there. yeah. Yeah, it's good karma for me, honey. Exactly. So, but that's a frustrating thing about TV. Mm. You're just getting into this thing, like you know, when Wingulamoto, the producer and director, left and started their own company. So, yeah, nobody wants to produce Wingulamoto anymore. So that came to an end. Um, but you know, after that, there was there was a series I did called Changes. Changes, mm-hmm. yeah. This was before Sense Eight. I think that for me was. More had more of an impact in terms of acting at an international level because South Africa came in with a, a Mnet. It was an Mnet gig, wasn't it? And yeah. they trained us in mm-hmm. the Meisner technique. They got a trainer from LA called mm. Rob Mello. He came, he trained us in beginner Meisner. We still did our repetition. We got, he, he t- taught us character work. Okay, it made such a huge impact. <laughs> that makes so much sense because a lot of guys who started at Changes mm-hmm. took off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And ch- changes sense. made a... So Sense8 was fascinating because it was the way that Hollywood does film. Like, th- let me tell you, well, us guys are here just nimaing each other budgets mm-hmm. and trying to shoot a film in a small one location and changing the rooms. Like, the way that Hollywood or the way that America works is that the budget is thrown into making the production as amazing as possible. Mm. Like there's nothing that the director asked for that he was told he can't get. Even zebras. <laughs> we painted donkeys. Mm. Okay, we'll get that. Yeah, because we, we're like, let's try get zebras. But every time you go next to zebras, they run away. So then what's the solution? Let's paint donkeys. 
like zebras. So imagine the guys who are painting donkeys. Oh. Like, <laughs> can you imagine? Like that kind of... <laughs> like, Bro, I did a gig on Sense8. <laughs> <laughs> I was painting yeah. zebras. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Or like this 5,000 person riot mm. where this the rehearsal period it took, all these extras who played a, a, a part in that 5,000 stampede yeah were in rehearsal for two months five there was, five th- there was a department that was do- going to do the they're going to be splashed by water they are rehearsing the splashing of water there's a department that's going to beat they're rehearsing the beating there's a department that's being beaten mm-hmm. so everyone has and they're rehearsing for two months can this you imagine means they're getting paid. they're getting thousand. paid yeah. so they're not even extra these guys are featured this are getting, yeah this they're is getting money. paid they're, yeah this was good i mean then you have drones and it doesn't matter those days drone getting a license for drones was, was like oh, yeah. ray cray will just whatever it takes we need mm. to have a drone nobody blo- blocks off uh, globe cinema yeah ah, that happens what will it take let's block off yeah. globe cinema we need i think it was 8000 or 5000 motogadis to create a traffic jam here mm-hmm. Still. Everyone who has friends who have cars were paying each person, I think it was 2,000 or something, or 1,500 or something. <laughs> just let them to come park their car okay. here and chill. And chill. They can send a driver. <laughs> we see. just need a traffic jam. Imagine the expense was, it's like they do ho- wow. movie making like it's a hospital bill. You know how you can't clear a, a, a person out of hospital until you've paid all the bills and you have to pay everything that is needed. That's how they, they deal with it. Out. They oh, go wow. all out. Yeah. There's no, we don't have a budget. We can't do that. All those limitations we put on our films, I didn't see it. And then also the idea behind teamwork. I remember during the casting process, the director, I was working very closely with Tom when it came to selecting, especially the uh, gangsters, Blackstar. What's the notice his name? Blackstar was for Rafiki. Oh, Luanda's role. I saw Yeah. Him. Luanda's role, we get it. Luanda, yeah, I can't ah. believe. You see, when you, now characters overlap because Blackstar was There's Neville. So many. Neville's role in Rafiki. The selection of those group of boys, it was like these guys need to form a gang. They mm-hmm. need to like have grown up together. So it's there. Okay, he makes a selection of three or four actors. I like this guy. I like this guy. I like this guy. I like this guy. Then okay, personality wise. Does he is he a team player? How does he work in a mm-hmm. group? Is he the kind of guy who likes to go off and segregate? Mm-hmm. Like you, <laughs> you would not have been one of those boys. I'd have been like he's anti-social. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> so then you selected based on the character traits yeah. of how you work in a team. It's meticulous. So it's like it's not just based on your performance. It's based on more than that. Like mm. he's looking for like like he's thought about these characters. Mm. He's thought about what he wants. He's thought about how he wants this to play out. He's thought about the music. As guys when you make movies. I'm it's so refined. Something different. Yeah, uh, completely. I, just to <clears throat> pick the lessons in that lapse, eh? let's go to mention, you mentioned Meville. So let's go to Rafiki. Is it a different taste? Ama, you don't even think about times at Sensei when, when you're on that set because now you're coming in this time as an actor. Yeah. Yeah. So how is that? Are you First like, of all, especially because Uko Wanuri, you, you're when, from there. What? I know, but Wanuri and I are very, 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 very good friends. Ah, you're close. We're very, very, so we'd been talking about this film even before the, uh, when she was still writing it. Okay. When she still, when she needed uh, actors to read, we, we, you know, I read scenes for her. Um, I was planting a woodlot in, on some piece of property mm-hmm. that they had in Karen. Mm-hmm. So then we'd have all these conversations while I was planting the woodlot. And so I knew about this film from the beginning and I wanted to, to be a part of the film, but I also wanted to support my friend in the process of making this film because she was very uh, worried about the way that it would be received because of the content. Yeah. It mm-hmm. could be taken out of context. The content could be taken out of context, mm. which is what happened. And it did, yeah. It was completely taken out of mm. context. And she was worried about the, like, the would it become a violent thing? Would she be thrown in jail? Would she have her rights taken away from her? That's So it was more of like wanting to be there for my friend. So 
with Wanori, she was very involved in the casting process. Wanori has a... Have you watched this film of hers that's on Netflix? Le, uh, no, the, the, let, let the Nia Long one. Yeah, what is it called? Let, what is it called? Let's check it out. I mean, I watched the yeah. movie and then I'm like, I know this director. I imagine, I'm like, <laughs> you didn't I know, know it this. was us? No, not yet. Oh, Although wow, the credits had run, but I was distracted. <laughs> so then I, I'm like, I know this. Mm. This work is familiar. It's this like, is I, a familiar feel. Yeah. 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 And then I'm like, I would just, I went to the information page on Netflix and I look was like, both ways. Look ah. both ways. There you go. Wanuri has a specific style. Yeah. And she's very like she loves color and she thinks about the music she's like tom she's thought about the music she's thought about the fabrics she's thought about the textures of the season how it must look because it must be the kind of gray sky that will enhance i mean wanori is a freaking artist so i wanori's directing is on the same level and that's why she's in america yeah or in canada right now like that's why she is where she is because she's her, her she's too big She's too big for the people. We don't get her in this country. Mm. She had the most amazing casting process as well. She used a lot of music, a lot of music to get into moods, to get us to to get into our stories because I've married to Jimmy Gathu's character and then we get divorced and then now we have this relationship where I am bitter but I still love him and he's moved on. And that we played, we did music. She had all mm. these techniques with this um, trainer called Elizabeth Hesseman who came from Netherlands. Again, an opportunity to be in the midst of like wonderful trainers of actors so that they teach you technique and skill. Yeah, yeah. So Rafiki injected more power <laughs> into my skill yeah. as an actor because we were actor. taken through a workshop. Mm. Like just being meticulous about the thing that you need as a director. You know, her producer was Big World Cinema, Stevie, um, Stephen Mar Markowitz from South Africa. And he's a, an amazing producer. He also wants to give to the production what the production budget is. He's not trying to buy a house in Ashinde yeah. and to build a house in Kitengela with the production money. He's trying to make yeah. the production, make the film a film. And Wanuri is amazing. Oh, man. Yeah. Sounds beautiful. Yes. Um where you are right now we we are seeing at least especially this year we've seen a couple of sessions with nini for young actors for actors who are out here doing their thing yeah. is it the seasons of training that you're pulling back from and saying over these years this is what i have ama you're like yo this is the nini way let's jump into this and was it that experience that has brought like has uh, made you now decide to do this no i think the, what I not I think I know that what I want to do is to like leap over this gap that happens when I'm on set mm -hmm. with this new actor who's never been on a set. Right? There's a lot of kids or actors who come to the theater but they don't know the set. So when they come on the set then they have this way of being that you waste a lot of time mm -hmm. because they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know how to behave. They don't know set etiquette. They don't know what their work is as actors when they when they get the script what they're supposed to be doing at home because then if they've worked in the theater, they know you come to rehearsal and you rehearse the play. So there's a gap that happens where I feel like we, we're not balanced when I'm on set with this new actor. What's this that's lacking here? Yes, they have um, talent, but you can't, you can barely get to the talent because they're nervous. They don't know what they're supposed to do. So I wanted to bridge that gap mm -hmm. so that I can teach the things that you would be taught in acting school or which is, I mean, I would love to open a fully fle a full fledged dr dramatics, dramatic arts school or, you know, performing arts, theater, dance, the works here in Kenya, because I feel like the skills, especially needed for screen are not taught anywhere. So that's what I wanted. And I thought that all the things that I've learned along the way about my work as an actor, with my character and my script. And so that when I get on set, I just get on set to do the work as opposed to be then told what to do. I wanted to to share that. I also came back from a, sab a sabbatical that I took during the COVID period where I went to live in Elementaita. And when I came back from country, to do Country Queen, when I was on set, I was just seeing all these new faces. I'm like, who are these new actors? 
So then I go to the National Theatre just to start like t- touching base and meeting guys and seeing mm. what's up. Mm. And, you know, you just go back to the theatre. You always just go back to the theatre because it's the easiest space to meet actors, have a conversation, find out what's happening. Then I realized that like workshops were, were needed. People weren't asking for, oh, where can I get training? Do you know where I can get training as an actor? Just sitting up there in Wasani, by the way, Wasani, Wasani. Wasani, yeah. People are asking that question. So I was like, maybe I should do a workshop. Maybe I should do master classes just to teach because it seems to be a need. Mm. So that, so that's how it was born. Yeah. Also, I wanted yeah. to be with actors. I love being with actors. Yeah, yeah. it's a great community. Are, are, are these workshops and master classes still going on? Yeah, so I took a break to do Speak Their Names because me, I have a one-track mind. I tried to do both and it was too tedious. Be- it's too tedious. Speak their names was every day. It was very intense. Then I didn't have time to prepare for the classes or to get the students needed for the class. I just didn't have time to do enough of the marketing. So mm. my I wasn't I wasn't getting enough people to come in for the classes. So I decided to take a break, do the play, and then now I want I'm I'm organizing a birthday workshop for myself on the fifteenth. Si- my birthday is on the sixteenth, so fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth of January. A three day workshop. Yeah. Ah, as a birthday present to self. Yeah. That's yeah. a great plug. By then we'll be fresh out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with the episode. And and, yeah. and, and it's yeah. all day. <sighs> or how, how how does the structure work? And this is a very So you just let me organize this. <laughs> no, the, the <laughs> details will be shared. Actually, yeah. It's no, preempting because it is, it is going yeah. to be full day workshops. So what I realized was that was what they wanted. They wanted a, a more time because mm-hmm. my 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 master classes are three, four mm-hmm. hours. And it would be nice to get more into scene work, into character work. Mm. So a lot longer is needed with this group. You know, you can train a group and then you lose them. Mm. So I want to get all my old booze who are in a WhatsApp group and get them to come for this w- workshop, which will be three days of training and work on different aspects of each person's skill plus technique plus character work that's mainly what i want to do so i think that they will be full day okay. full day classes yeah. so i'm looking for a location and i think they will be at the garden uh, in garden estate if the weather has switched because it, i need a garden space i need a place that has trees that has grass because a lot of the work that we'll do will involve being barefoot on the ground and what better place to do that than on the ground mm. in grass. oh my god mm. how incredible I know. Yeah, I, I can. And maybe we should we should come do the meditation. They'll, you know, there's also stuff like that, like meditation work that actors need to do so that you can center yourself. And mm. even for connecting with each other, mm. if you can calm your mind and calm your thoughts, you can get more into your character. So meditation is something you could actually come do, Commander. And to be honest, um, I don't know if anyone from work listens to this. The reason I'm also asking about the plans is maybe, who knows? Commander always has a thing for, like, you know, Kigondu and I met in theater, what, 15 years ago? Mm. And maybe, just maybe, there's still something in me that... Of course there is, not is, maybe. Is, actually, there is. Always there is. Always. Um, I've just chosen to ignore it. <laughs> I've not chosen... It's like, I want to yeah. make money, so... No, it, it's, it's yeah. Uh, I've, I've not, let's say, I've not been very mindful of that part of, let's say, my... This thing that keeps coming up. I'm like, okay, I see it somewhere. I see yeah. it somewhere. I'm not very mindful of it. Um, I'm not. I've managed to tame that desire. Occasionally, he'll tell you. Um, I don't know if he knows that I'm serious, but I'm actually serious. Hey, by the way, when you're next writing something, uh, could you write a few sentences <laughs> with me in mind? I want uh, him to direct me, to write for me and direct me, and he thinks it's, it's a happening. joke. It's happening. No, it is happening. Nene, it is happening. In fact, speaking of that um, a workshop and the three-day, like me, I'm Rick. This is like for those guys out there. Which camera? Which camera? This one. No, this one. Am I in frame? This camera. This camera. Yeah. Hot ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah? <laughs> this, I, I, so to this camera. Nini, you already know she's phenomenal. Just show up. Just come out. Tell your friends. Sell it out. Watch a rudie like every month at this rate. So yeah. do. Right now, we only know it's around the 16th. But the, uh, the, the, the the details will the details. be on the show yeah. notes. Yeah. We'll yes. make sure we put it we everywhere. Let me try to shift that energy. But yes, it is happening. I am directing you. I am on set with you again. I'm writing with you in mind. This is happening. Oh, I love yeah? it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about where you are presently. You said something. And we can not talk about it. Yes, there is a lament but there is also the wood. 
Woodlots. Woodlots. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know if it was an actual thing, so I've written woodlot. So woodlotting, that's a verb. Yes. No, no. Tell us. Yeah. It's like lots of wood. Mm-hmm. Ah, ah, good. So it's wood a lot. noun. It's yeah, a woodlot. It's a, yeah. it's a wood okay, let's talk about woodlotting. I'll make it a word. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> how did you get into that and how's that for you right now? And I know you're into... I like the, the question, how did I get into that? You know what I'm into? Sorry? You, you were saying... Uh, I know you're into, uh, is it afforestation? Afforestation, reforestation. Reforestation. Yeah, greening uh, the planet, ecosystem yeah. restoration, mm. call it what you want. Let's talk about that just a bit. Um, first of all, I think if I had like calmed myself down enough in my 20s, I think I would have studied environmental sciences if mm. I had just calmed my head for a moment to think, because I always enjoyed biology, always. Yeah. Bad at chemistry, didn't do physics, but biology was my B. So I, my, my boo. So when I was in Nigeria shooting Desperate Housewives Africa. <laughs> There's so many like projects we could talk about. I could go. I know. Yeah. I wanted, I was so crazy. You know how Nairobi has a Karura forest? Mm-hmm. I don't know. We are spoiled Aburetan. in Nairobi. Aboretum, we're spoiled, the mm. national park. We're mm-hmm. just spoiled for open spaces within the city. We were living in Aja, which was like, you know, this town called Kamande on the way to. Uh, Wacha. To Na- Naivasha. <laughs> Is it past Naivasha? Hey, there's an actual place called Kamande. <laughs> well, I think Kimande. I think it's oh, called Kimande. 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 <laughs> Kimande. <laughs> Kimande. <laughs> so, I'm like, I'm like oh, Maze Wachara is coming for me hard. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So it you mended the trees and all. No, no, but like the town, you know how yeah. it's yeah. like. Yeah, the kind of, yeah. But now imagine that they've done, they've cleared the trees. Ooh. Oh. And they're building these tattoo city like things. Yeah. Right? So there's tattoo city one, tattoo city yeah. two. In mm-hmm. fact, we had when one of those um gated communities that had just been built in Aja. Yeah. yeah. Right? It, yeah. The place we were in mm-hmm. Aja. So that they've cut all the trees and it's just full on hardware, hardware stores and construction. So let's even call it like Rongai. 15, 10, 15 years ago, how Rongai was, Tuala, that mm. like dusty, they've cut down mm. every Looks single hideous. living thing. Yeah. They've chased the wild animals or eaten them. You know, it's just like dry, it's a desert. They've eaten them. So we're <laughs> we shooting. T- we took that. <laughs> I noted that. We're yeah. shooting in Aja and it's far from, it feels very far from Lagos or VI, which mm. is where you would go hang out, not even Lagos. Um, so you, we, VI is um, Victoria Island. So there's nothing to do in Aja. And it was the most frustrating thing. So I remember asking, like, just like asking people, is there a forest? Is there a place I can go? Ah, you're going, you're going, you're going to get eaten by the forest. You, you're going to get eaten in the forest. We don't, eat, we don't go to the forest. You're going to get attacked. You're going to get raped. All these stories. So I was like, there's no space in Nigeria where like they've like fenced and there are trees inside people couldn't understand like a karura that's not a like, concept it's not a concept it's just like so i was googling and then I, I don't know why it came to me i was like Kwani, how are forests formed i never thought about it. i was like do people plant forests or do forests plant themselves mm. because i've seen plantations of trees but i've never seen a forest being planted and then now from that question came answering the question and I went down the rabbit hole and discovered the Miyawaki technique, which is a, the um, Akira, Akira Miyawaki is a Japanese scientist who discovered a way to reforest the Japanese coastline after the tsunami. And because he didn't have time, he needed these trees to grow in one year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He needed, he, needed a, he needed forest cover in one year. That's because yeah. if you don't have forest cover, the next rainy season, this ocean is going to destroy again. us. And now we have no trees. Because what happened is they planted a lot of pines on the coast of Japan and pines are not indigenous. So he realized that the way that non-indigenous trees grow and the way that indigenous trees grow, the indigenous trees grow in a way that structures and holds your soil mm. and keeps the water, retains the water in the environment. So the And the non-indigenous tree grows in a way that doesn't retain your soil and causes more damage. Because when the tsunami came and the pines were felled because they had deep tap roots and had no, none of these um, spreading mm. roots, they fell and they crashed and they went and demolished the houses and the buildings. But all the buildings and houses 
that were behind the indigenous parts of the beach where mm -hmm. indigenous forests still existed didn't get destroyed. So imagine you have a place with pine, the pine takes everything. everything. Yeah. You have a place with indigenous forest, everything behind the forest is intact. So there might be some trees fell, there might be some branches, but the trees have held mm. until the tsunami passed. Mm. So then he just copies what he sees. Mm -hmm. He realizes that the trees have this, um, like imagine the internet, the trees form the internet in the ground so that they feed each other, they communicate with each other, they tell each other where there's no water, where there's... Wh through bacteria? Through my, mycelium. Mycelium, yeah. Mycelium. Mycelium, sorry. The, yeah. the thin little stringy things yep, that grow yep. and connect the trees. Yep. But also the root system itself. You can't remove this tree and then say this tree's root is different from this tree. No, because when they grow, they entangle yep, yep. and become one. So you can't tell which one belongs to which. So he just copied that and planted three million trees along the coastline of Japan. And the forest grew in one, two years and was self-sustaining after that. So this guy, um, Shubendu Sharma, had done a TED Talk on the Miyawaki technique. And I listened to the TED Talk and I just incorporated, in fact, I contacted him. I, I asked, told, asked him, how does this happen? What do you do? He, him and I started speaking about the indigenous trees. I didn't know about indigenous trees and non-indigenous trees. So I just got into this hole. I came back from Nigeria. I went to Karura Forest. I bugged those people to give me books, teach me, show me what they look like. They sent me to Ngong Forest. They sent me to a guy called Sami, who I still work with today. He's a forester. He taught me even how to harvest. Like, I, you, you know, this world is amazing. Once you show interest in something, it's like mm -hmm. Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. Chubulu, <laughs> going to the rabbit hole. Wanori wanted a forest on her property. So she gave me leeway to practice everything that I'd learned through Shubendu Sharma. Plus, I also did permaculture, uh, PDC, mm -hmm. a permaculture design course. And I studied syntropic agriculture so I could understand how to create food forests, mm -hmm. not just forests. Yeah. So my first forest or woodlot, which is a small forest or a small collection of wood in an urban area or a tiny forest, oh, is in Karen. Wow. Amazing. I, I like that you, you spoke about it as passionately as you did the acting. Uh, uh, totally. Yeah. It's yeah. the first time since maybe high school or maybe primary school that someone has used the word taproot. <laughs> 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 did you remember Yo, that? and as beautifully as she I did. I know it's know. like taproot. Taproot. Your taproot, and then there's a fiber. Is that true? Spreading. Yeah. Spreading roots. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Hey. Yes. I know they have another name, but they may I call them like those ones that do this. Mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. ones that, that makes more sense. And the internet of that. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you found it. Yes. The I also that you did. Do you know I grew mushrooms just from discovering mycelium? I did a mushroom. Hot, sort of, hot, hot sort of mushrooms. Um, button mushrooms. Shit, those are the craziest babies in the world. Like they are worse than babies. You think you have to go home and be a father? You wouldn't even be here <laughs> if you doing had this yep, yep. if you had mushrooms. Yeah. They are so insane. Yeah. You can't leave them. They're so needy. They're so needy. It's so delicious when you grow them yourself so. and you don't refrigerate them. And I also keep bees. So it's crazy. I consume all the things I grow. That's I, beautiful. Yeah, tell us more about anything. Is this at um, Elementita? Yeah. So the bees are in Elementita. Mm. The mushrooms, I did them here in Nairobi. Uh, my mom had a chicken shed and then all her chicken was stolen and then she didn't want to do it again because she had just lost psych for the whole chicken business. So I asked her if I could revamp her shed and grow mushrooms and I grew them in her chicken shed. Mm. And then and then I decided I'll never grow mushrooms again. Yeah. Ever. After the hustle. And Ever. You But the bees are in Elementita. Okay. Yeah. Mm. You eating what you, you grow? Is is this the is this the secret to youth? I'd say the secret to youth is don't get married. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. No. <laughs> Says the only married guy in the room. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I and the guy who's that. now looking old among the hey. just to call it Hey, you know now we're on video. <laughs> just check out these videos and tell us if I look like him. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Let's speak let's speak in 5 years. Okay. <laughs> just in the romantic phase. Let's speak in 5 um, years. You know I I I did celebrate my 5th year in marriage last year. No, hey. no, I'm talking 10, 11 years. Yeah. 7 <laughs> years each. 7 year each by the way. Mm. But actually it's not let me not let me not lie i think yeah. the thing with me is that i have lived a lot of my life outdoors i live a lot of my life outdoors and i think that could be the secret that to you yeah um i think when you live with nature and you spend time in nature there's a way that nature just takes away your problems mm. yeah and nairobi is a tedious city to live in i think you need to like take some time out and come back in that has helped as well yeah. but i tell you on a day when like if i remove my makeup i just look like a, you've seen me a 44 year old woman no at at still at still <laughs> hello at you hello he says now he was working with me for two months he didn't hello what's, what's that what's that so <laughs> 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 no, fine, That's what's up. No, b- 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 as we wind up, as we Jackie, wind up, Jackie, yeah. look at us. Um, COVID starts, so it's tied to, it's a segue, still, I think, in the same story. COVID starts, and before we started recording, we were talking about how you moved to Elementita. So, um, and you spent an incredible one and a half years um, in that environment. How, how was it like, and how um, was the return back to Nairobi? Okay, so I think... Um I think this one I want to keep for my engaged talk. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. oh yeah. No actually out, no yeah. because this thing might not come out. Anyway, so Oh yeah. No so, we can yeah, we can we can shelf it until after. Then get no, talk no. is like in a week in or two. In a week or two yeah and this won't come out in a week or two. Yeah. Mm. So 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 this is what happened. Mm. I didn't so I was in element uh, Do you remember when they were building this freaking highways all over Nairobi that just didn't make sense to us guys who had never had super highways of t- roads on top of buildings you know they destroyed Nairobi and Nairobi was so difficult to move around in that it was so frustrating it was so hard for, i don't know like two years i just mm. got tired of this freaking city so i said oh oh i have bought this land in Elementaita and i've never done anything with it let me go and see if i can just fence it and then see if i can set up my retirement start setting mm-hmm. up my retirement plan now as i'm doing that the lockdown happens so me as the mentality then the lockdown happens so i can't go back so i built a platform put up a tent because before it was just take a two man tent go camp do the fence plant some trees come back like that stay three weeks stay a month like that i used to just do that like camp for a month come back Now I had to build a permanent structure that I could live in but there are no builders because people are now running away because of covid so I just got this guy and two other boys to come we built a platform put up the Masai Mara tent built a compost toilet all the stuff I'd learned in permaculture I was so excited permaculture was very surprising for me it introduced me into a fabulous way of living with the earth where before i had thought it was so difficult to live in nature and i love camping i love the outdoors i've always been the kind of person who if i had an way of an opportunity i'm going to be on a campsite yeah. somewhere mm-hmm. so uh, this was great because now it's my property and we're setting it up and i'm making a plan and i'm excited so now i'm alone there and i have to make it work because it's not like i'm alone and i have a choice and let me tell you there were so many things there was like uh, you you've never been in a place that's so silent that you can hear the wind rustling individual leaves in trees did you know that there were birds that sing at night no do you know that occasion makes this sound like it's twisting on yep, itself yep, in yep. it's it's like like squeaking sound because it is twisting upon itself Did you know that hippos eat the bark of a tree like it's candy so they eat all the flesh and then they leave the center so the tree doesn't die but they eat all the bark on top like it's candy mm-hmm. Masai will steal grass from you so you have to protect your grass <laughs> Bees kill dogs Um my dog was eaten by a cheetah tiger which are the ones that are in Kenya leopard oh, yeah. 
leopard. 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 It, it ate another puppy of mine. So your dog is is food. Did you know that dogs are food for other animals? I did not know any of that stuff. So I discovered nature. Then I this like real, real like you guys. The threat is not with human mm. beings. The threat is with the animals. Mm. Hyenas are huge. They're like almost five foot or four foot tall. When they are, mm-hmm. they they are not as tiny as they were in Lion King. <laughs> you know, they're huge freaking animals. Comparisons are to be cute. <laughs> <laughs> laughing, yeah, of course, and they're not laughing. These oh, they're things, not laughing. They're not laughing, and they will come, and they stink, and you smell them before you see them. Oh my God, Elementita was amazing, and I'm alone, so I had to talk myself through every single noise. I had to be like, okay, Washera. First of all, you can hear footsteps. It's so quiet you can hear footsteps. So if they, I'm I'm alone. So I'm thinking all the things that women think when they're alone. I'll be raped. I'll be killed. I'll be all that stuff. But now I have to talk myself into calming my fear, so that my heart stops racing. So now I can hear, because your heart races so loud that it overpowers every other sound. So you think it's like someone's shooting at you. Someone's, but you know, it makes so much noise. Yeah. So you have to, Vipassana came in really handy here. You have to dissociate, you have to meditate, you have to quiet your thoughts. You have to understand that your fear lives mainly in your brain than, than what's really happening in reality. These are all the things I learned there. And then I had to be again by myself. I had to go through... <laughs> I didn't I don't like myself. I don't like my breath. I don't <laughs> like how you look today. You start fighting with yourself. You know, you're the only person to talk to there. Mm. Um I lost I lost my dog Black. He was stolen by one of my workers. I'd had a guy to help. But the guy was just sorrowing how this dog and I have a relationship. He stole my dog. So now I'm lonely even now times 52. Then um after about when the COVID was, maybe, was it six months just about to end? I insisted on getting my daughter there mm-hmm. just for a week or two to stay with me. So I managed to sneak her through the boundaries and then she came to see me. But that was after six months. But I came back. I built a, a permanent cottage in the process as well. Then um, Country Queen called and said, yo, we'll be shooting. It was like now April of the next year. I, tr- I, I mean, because I tried many things. I was planting trees. I was trying to keep livestock. I was realizing what that land can support, what that land can't support, what kind of vegetables grow here, mm. what fruit will grow. All this I was in discovery as I'm living there. And then Country Queen calls and they say, we need you in August. And then I mm. look at myself and I'm like, oh, what the fuck? I'm black <laughs> as coal. <laughs> I have those hands for the shamba, yep. you know. Mm. Um, I have sunburn on my skin. I'm skinny. But healthy. Very healthy, but skinny because you don't need anything excess goes. The sun, the wind, the work, the yeah. everything. And I was doing a lot of the work, like slashing. Oh my God, I had such, I, mean, I miss my arms. I had <laughs> such strong arms. I was just like, umundu strong, by the way. I was, I had those things dense hey. in the middle of mm-hmm. the back. Yeah. Hey. I was, but not beautifully. I mean, when I came for country queen, guys were like, like that. People gasped in shock. Ask Abu, by the way. Oh, Abu. <gasps> Abu with the noises. Yeah. No. Mm. <gasps> no. Komaka. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is related. I tell you why. Abu with the noises. Abu with the noises. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't think, I don't know if it was a comeback, or, but I got it. I don't know if it was a comeback. I mm. just know that I came back to do the thing that I had done the pilot for mm. in 2019, which mm. we had been waiting for. And then COVID came and cut out the story. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and and how was that experience coming back? Did you enjoy to do like, ah, man, this feels good? No. no okay. Wait, what come back? To Nairobi to, or coming back to, to, to screen? To, to screen. Nair- to, no. To screen. Okay. Oh. No, I was scared shitless. I okay. thought I had lost oh. acting. I don't know how you can lose it. I thought I, it's like riding a bicycle or maybe you haven't driven a car in 20 years and you get into a car and then you're like, and you're like, oh, 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 like that. That's what it felt like. Like my first day, I was so anxious. I can even tell you the scenes where that were the first day of shoot. Even when I watch, I tell you that was day one. That yeah, was day one that I can tell you. 
which was day one because I was like, I don't know how to act. I don't know what I'm doing. I haven't been with people in so long. It was so nerve wracking. Even the first day, at least with, with Country Queen, they, there's a lot of space for like, let's meet, let's rehearse, let's get back into the swing of things. Pole pole. They don't just throw you into the deep end. So we were eased into it. Then our sets were very separate, like, the guys in Silanga and the guys in Nairobi. So I didn't meet. It okay. wasn't. It was just me and Blessing mm -hmm. and some very. I only saw Melissa once, so we didn't mix. Mm -hmm. we, it was very specifically like short. That. And then, because COVID, all the regulations were in, were keeping distance and not talking to each other. So it was a nice way to come back in because it wasn't Kuma. It a bah, yeah. You're back and now and you have the to be. Mm. Yeah. And I didn't know how to relate. I didn't know how to socialize. I didn't know how to small talk. I still don't know small talk. All that stuff that we used to just do that comes naturally. With a hi, what's up? You're saying absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot how to do all that. So it was very jolting. Mm -hmm. But then it's like riding a bicycle or driving a car. It just comes back to you like, oh, yeah. You just warm up the muscle yeah, exactly. and then eventually and then the, muscle is, the muscle never went. The muscle never went. Yeah. But it was, yeah. It was. Yeah, then like, do I back. want to do this? Do I, I know. We're glad you're yeah. back. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. So glad you're Jack back. Jack is telling us that we've been, <laughs> we've been going for too long. And there, there's so many paths that we could explore. Uh, but I, I, I always leave room. We always leave room open for part two. And I think this is. We could spend all this day here. We, this is this is very, very beautiful. <laughs> so you want to wrap up? Start wrapping up? Yes. Why not? Why not? We could be, do the big three. Yeah. And before we do the big three, yeah. I think wrapping up on the personal and professional. And we I do promise, a little. Play. Yeah. We won't go into like a, a one-hour thing. So in in terms of your acting, there, there's something I put um a point on. Um, you said that where back th back back then when you did, you did um uh, dangerous affair. And at some point, you're thinking maybe there is an impact that my work has, might have on girls, for instance, or whatever, on community, on society. Um, right now, as you think about art, is that a thought that comes to mind? Maybe what could be the in, could could the impact of this be five, ten years down the line? Are you more thoughtful about that process? I, like I'm more, I think I'm more thoughtful about. Um what I want to impact. And okay. before I wasn't, right? Before I wasn't, before I just did, like what I want to leave, what I want to imprint, I'm more thoughtful about it, but not even from just being an actor, but from just being an individual. And it's taken me a long time to like find the things that I like. And because mm -hmm. I like my private, not to find the things outside of acting that I would like to, to engage in on a public forum. Let me say that, because I know what I like. But because of being a celebrity and then wanting your private life to be your private life, I've want, always wanted to keep that as mine. But I'm going through something quite challenging right now, and I think I have to be very public about it. Um, and I think this particular thing that I'm, you're going to see what it is, you're going to hear what it is, will start to engage me on a more message-conscious way towards people who follow me or listen to me or but I've never actually taken my name and used it to to take any calls forward I've never done the two I've mm -hmm. never merged the two and now I'm more aware of the fact that I can use my name to pass messages on and that's now what are those messages which ones in because you could go any direction and as I said I didn't know what impact this was back then I didn't understand the impact that that character would have on young girls and maybe I'm blaming myself for something that's not true. Do you understand? But it's a thing that I saw. I saw it when I was in my 20s. We didn't behave like this. And now when I'm in my 40s, girls are behaving like this. What was, what's one of the things that influences society is the media. So what did these girls see that is now the way that they behave? Us guys being on shows that showed that we could be taken care of by rich men. But it wasn't us guys who wrote the scripts. It wasn't us guys who created the characters. But now I'm more conscious of, even if I do play a role that might communicate a different message to the young girl, to be aware of it enough in interviews to say that I'm showcasing a side of society, but this is not who I am. This is not what I am supporting. I'm saying this personality exists and 
let's be aware that this kind of person, this land grabbing, greedy woman exists. And what are we going to do if we recognize that in ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just aware of creating a, the distance between the character and myself. That is beautiful. And I wish, we wish you all the best in doing that because society needs <coughs> that. We mm. all need that. Mm. Um, yeah. We do. Actually, it's extremely I, valuable. Mm. Yeah. As, as, as you're sharing that, it just crossed my mind. I was like, oh, I'd love to have this conversation in 20 years. Yeah. I know. This, yeah. I know. Wow. Because wow. To now we'll again look at it in retrospect. Yes. Because yeah. I'm sure you will. I'm sure. So far, and even from the story, what we can tell is when she goes for it, you go for mm. it. So we can't wait Tap for root. that. Tap root. <laughs> there you Tap go. Root, baby. Yeah. Yeah. All the best. Um, the, the, the one of, for me personally, the most powerful thing about all that is having and talked to you and known you at, at this level today. One of the things that I recognize is that you're full of so much love. And yeah, no, 100%. And you doing this will have that effect on society. Mm. Because at the end of the day, it will converge to people being better. Mm. Yeah. And people loving each other and recognizing the connect the connection between all of us. Mm. You know. Mm. That's that if if I don't know what else the world needs to be honest. I if know. not more love. No love. That's yeah. all we need. That, that is it. And you're full of it. Oh. And it will mm. be everywhere <laughs> if you do this consciously. That's yes. a message. Yes. Mm. People will not realize it, but okay. I'm changing in certain ways. Yeah. And I'm becoming more loving. And that's beautiful. Thank mm. you. Maybe that's there's a beautiful. bias because of that's how I we see the world. At least I know you're going to see the world in the same way. And all of us see the world in that yeah. way. Sure. Yeah, um, but you guys are really like awake and very aware. The two of you. you. Sante. Yeah. I, Sante. Thank you. <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> we'll take it at Tongeza. At Tongeza. But I, I could attest to her loving nature. Um, that last couple of months we spent together. Ah, yeah, I've had my mind space days. Yeah. And I remember some days, even on tougher days, I'd be in a space with you and uh, the energy you brought yeah. in that loving kind of way yeah. always made me come back to life. So thank you yeah. for all that you are, all that you have gone through, all that you're becoming. We celebrate that. You're clearly busy being born. That's what you hear. Here's, here's busy about, being born. Here's the thing yes. about busy being, do being born. Um, I don't know if you've experienced it. I'm sure you have. We're kindred spirits. Whenever Kigondu tells me about someone coming, because he's obviously thought about this person, and he's like, I'm like, okay, man, that's such a big day. How are they like? Will they have a two-hour conversation? And will we, maybe a selfish endeavor it always is, will we learn, will we enjoy that conversation? And he tells me, bro, trust me. <laughs> and like freaking clockwork. Nice. He's like, he told me that Nini is an amazing person oh. she is yeah and and you guys will enjoy the conversation yes. and this is me beaming after <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm literally glowing because and he told me he told me yeah, this that's so um, cool that's yeah so, cool. so thank you so much for doing this a few um, yeah two yeah. three two three yeah, yeah the first one would be 20 books 20 books um 20 books. you big you mentioned reading um i i'll probably get the name wrong helen Schuller. Yeah. 365 Shul days. Shul Shul, yeah. Shula, Shuma, it's a German they name. They can't pronounce Kamande. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Properly, so it's okay. Yeah, so it's okay. Um, are, are you a big reader and what are you reading right now? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I know. I even carried it so that I could show you. That's what's happening. It's a she. It's a she. Oh. It's a she. And Magdalene That's a Matthews. Dope title. It's, I know. She's a librarian national who lives in Kenya, but grew up in the Ivory Coast and Ghana. And she was, um, her father was one of the, de one of the Democratic Party leaders, uh, actually the first party that formed in, the, in um, what do you call it, democracy, in the Democratic Republic of, of Liberia when it became a democratic country. Her, her father's Matthews was one of the guys who was vying for presidency and also I presume a warlord. But she's written this amazing story. When she was born, she was born in a family of boys and her f everyone knew it's going to be a boy. And then the mom was like, oh, she'll be okay. And then the dad was like, oh, it's a she. <laughs> and then it's a she has become the defining title of most of her life. Um, lots of amazing lessons as well. Um, she's also a very loving being. I've never met her, my hairdresser. Mm -hmm. 
gave me this book to yeah it was with her i said let me see it and then i liked that it's an african author because i'm always looking for african authors and i'm always looking for um real life stories or autobiographies especially from women and because especially women who've gone through challenging situations and are still alive and are still thriving because i feel like as women we need to celebrate each other's triumphs we're in a new era i think we're setting like our parents our mothers didn't leave leave us this legacy they were different kind of women and it's the first time this kind of woman exists who's grown up in the workplace and trying to define herself as a woman in a country that sees women as less you know so she's that african woman who inspires me now but before that i was reading viola davis viola davis <laughs> i've just finished it for the second time wow well. around Yeah and I'll probably do the same with this. I like to read and then reread. Yeah. yeah. So, Out of all the books you've read, um is there one that you'd gift to Yeah, pe- Moses people? Isagawa. Uh Oh my god. Oh my god. Moses Isagawa. The book about Uganda during Idi Amin's time. Moses Isagawa the It's okay. It's I can't believe I've forgotten the title. That is my favorite book and Life of Pi. Hey, did you like the movie? I know. I mean, the movie, like the movie? was exa- you know it it didn't disappoint. It ah, came that's... as close to the book. It was the first book movie and yeah, then you're not disappointed. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I lo- yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Writers, filmmakers, family if you to I'm sure you've had this question before but we like it as well cuz a hey, If you're to sit down for dinner with two people dead or alive and it could change but in this season of your life who do you think you'd desire to be across you on the table and it could change it could be a different answer from Kesho we'll give Julia. you three 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 yeah. so okay Nelson Mandela I still can't believe he's dead dead and Kimathi and Meryl Streep mm-hmm. What a devil. Powerful. <laughs> oh, powerful. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. She didn't come out the guy who feet. didn't make it, the guy who made it. And then the f- most amazing actress in the, yeah. in the world. Um lastly, the um, big one. The big one? Yeah. Um, so you on on sta- on a stage somewhere or you have the, nowadays it's it can be a digital stage where you're speaking to like the African continent and along Uh, on the stage with you on this forum with you are other big names but you don't have an opportunity to speak but there's something on your shirt there's a there's a message on your shirt that resonates might resonate across the continent what would that message be could be a quote could be a summary of an idea that you have maybe you were given this mountain to prove that it could move or it could be moved maybe you were given this mountain to prove it could be moved oh wow and makes me teary because i feel like you've just been brought here to tell me that <laughs> <laughs> oh man thank you thank and you, so you know it's i think i got it from this book oh uh-huh. i'm trying i think i got it from this book maybe you've been assigned this mountain to show others it can be moved and it's an unknown quote That's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. But what I've lived with to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. And that's from William Shakespeare. Hamlet. Just yes. the, f- the first sentence, the first part of that. To thine own self be true. Be true. We can't say any more after that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no idea whether both cameras are still on, <laughs> but yes, you who's listening to us, oh man, I'm sure you've had a brilliant ride. Whether you're driving, whether you were doing your laundry, whether you were just listening to us before you slept, then umekuwa up all night. We love you for it just as we love this particular guest, ladies and gentlemen, Nini Washera. Jesus Christ, we love you so much. <laughs> I love you, oh, Kimande. Man, and that was beautiful. Thank you Thank for you. having me, Kimande. Yeah. And scripts. <laughs> Kimande. Kimande. Kimande is a place. Kimande. Kimande is a place. You wanted to shade me up. Oh, good. <laughs> this place oh, is Kimande. Okay. <laughs> It looks shady. Oh, Kimande? Kimande. Not Kimande. Not Kimande. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for your much. time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's all we are. We are super grateful. Me too. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, 
Stay um, busy being born. Stay busy being born. Um, we have nothing to add on that. Thank you so much for joining with us. Remember, you can always find us on Facebook at the Busy Being Born Podcast, on Instagram and on Twitter at Busy Being Born underscore. And we are always promising to be- to do a better the job. Maybe we will. Um, actually, I think we will. Yeah. Stop apologizing. You guys are doing a great job already. Social media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nah. another story. We'll improve. We'll new improve. year, new things. New year, new us. Um, new go. us? No. Like bigger <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? Are you? It's like <laughs> breaking news. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. breaking. And um, yeah, and visit our website. We are there. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not really good at these things. Here. Here. <laughs> there. Here. Here now. Here. Um, yeah. So you can find us. Uh, Abu will cut this on the podcast. <laughs> Um, me trying to find my the camera um on our website that's where we are and we had we just had our first guest blog so hey, go check ahead it yeah, check it out came out the, a super super um gratitude a lot of gra- gratitude to Mothoni Minor our guest on episode 35 and she did a piece and it's it's beautiful um and i, I don't think you'd expect you'd have anything less than that. And we're also going to write a bit more. We always say that again, but I, I'm sure we will sure. um, periodically and share our thoughts there. So visit our website. That's at busybeingborn.africa. Busybeingborn.africa. And um, again, thank you so much for uh, your company. Thank and, you. Yeah. And as we always say, if you're not busy being born, then you're probably busy not leaving. I am Kamade. Kegodu. Peace. Peace. And she's Nini. I'm Nini. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> yeah. See ya. Stay yeah. busy. If you're not busy born. being born, you're busy being dead. You, you're busy? Yeah. That's the original quote. Yeah. You're busy dying. You're busy dying. But we that was a bit morbid, so we changed it to you're probably busy not living. <laughs> <laughs> Just say you're probably you're busy being dying. No, <laughs> you're busy, busy being, dying. You're busy dying. Hey, that's morbid. This is so cool, you guys. You guys have such nice energy. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Do look out for more from us. For now, Kwaheri.